にしめりをかけて」「もえるまちにあとわずか」「とどくさけびをみみにしてかえってきたぞかえってきたぞ」「かえってきたぞかえってきたぞ」Hello, you are listening to Ultra Q episode 51. My name is Red, I'm joined by Mel.、Uh, is Shai Hulu the Kaiju? Uh, yeah. Uh, and I'm joined by Brad. Mizuno was the original sapling. I see. I don't understand what this he means. He was. He was. He really was. He was celibate as well. It really makes perfect <laughs> sense. <laughs> I don't get the joke. What's, what's, what's a sapling? It's a, it's, 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 it's a hollow l i f e thing. It's Fauna's I, fans called saplings. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this podcast yeah, is sorry. a mistake. I shouldn't have invited two co hosts who are into VTubers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is your, this is your fault.、Um, coming up, like I just said, celibacy,、uh, Evangelion, jump scare,、uh, and、uh, vampires. Uh... Before we get to any of those,、uh, we'll do, you know, do a little warm up, do a little show and tell. Now, I, did, I don't have anything, but I will tell you that I am, I am basically the Messiah right now. I'm basically the Jesus.、Uh, I'm, like, my self sacrifice is、uh, just of a standard that should be heralded through time, because right now the grand final of the Age of Empires 2 Hidden Cup is happening.、Oh. Um, Uh, which is an event in which you, you don't know any of the players who, the, who you're playing against.、Uh, it's all, it's just, it started as just this idea of like, there's this guy called Viper. There's one guy called Viper who's too good at Age of Empires 2. And、um, it started as this idea from like popular uh, streamer uh, like T90,、um, who s like, does come, the you know, he, He does commentary for games and he's, he's saying, like, would people play better against Viper if they didn't know he was Viper?、Um, and that's kind of how Hidden Cup happened.、Uh, and now they've got this, like, elaborate thing going on where they all take up roles of, like, historical figures that are in the game as, char- as、uh, units.、Uh, and、um, yeah, and it's, you know, there's a lot of, like, speculation about, you know, Trying to, add, trying to figure out people's play style to figure out, oh, who, who, who could this be?、Um, and、uh, yeah, that's happening right now.、Uh, well, the, the third place、uh, match is happening right now, and then the grand final will be happening. That's, that's all I have. I haven't finished anything because I'm watching a bunch of 50 episodes. I'm still watching a bunch of 50 episode shows, as、nice. I do all the time. I'm watching Fresh Precure. That's a weird show. I like it a lot, it's goofy. Yeah, I saw this morning you were watching、uh, the Wig episode, which is legendary.、Oh, yeah. I, I, I watched the Wig episode uh, uh, like, a, like a week ago or something, but、oh, okay. I, 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 I had those images to hand <laughs> just because、yeah, I, I was like, this episode is so fucking weird. The, 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 like, the main character, Love, her dad decides, or, I, you know, is like, I'm going to make wigs for pets. <laughs> And that's, and it's like done as this dramatic thing. It's like, oh, we're going to make a wig that is like the, the perfect wig to make animals happy.、Um, anyway, Fresh Precure is daft. I like it a lot. 
Uh, I did see your unhinged take that you got through Stockholm Syndrome liking the OP. (laughs) Yeah, okay. So, the OP for Fresh Precure is terrible. It's not good. It's really bad. um, Because... Fresh, fresh, fresh. the, the fresh, The Fresh Precure OP is, like, fine. Except that for some reason they got a singer who can't sing. I don't know why they did that. I wouldn't have done that. I would have got someone who could sing to sing. Um, but they didn't. They got someone who can't sing. And now I'm at the point where I'm like, yeah, I like this. And my exact reasoning was, it's like I'm at karaoke and <laughs> my and my, fr- my friend can't sing, but I'm hyping <laughs> them up. Because that's what it's all about. Um, so yes, that's, you know, the fresh Precure OP, a good OP now. <laughs> it's all about it. It's all a matter of perspective. Um, but that's me. I don't have half an hour of uh, Elric chat this week. I I wish I... I, I immediately stopped... Look, well, okay, I was busy because I had a work deadline. Uh, and then one of our teams decided that they just didn't really feel like doing stuff. Uh, which means that our team had to do their work on top of our own work. So I worked, I think, 10 extra hours this week. Um, Jesus. Yeah, it was not fun. Um, And then I decided this weekend is also, you know, I got to do taxes. That's that's coming up for us. So I decided to do my taxes and also run a bunch of errands that I've been putting off this week. Um, and then I had to do some stuff at the post office, which also was not great. So, uh, I have this copy of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth that I have still not put in my PS5, which I'm sad about. Um, maybe later today, but we'll see. Um, you know what I have been doing, though, is, uh, my friend Ray has recently become extremely, uh, DC Comics, uh, pilled, as she described it. Yeah, it seems like a lot of ups and a lot of downs, and some of those downs seem really down, let me say. Yeah, I she's, bet. <laughs> she's, she's been posting some stupid panels and shit in the, uh, in, in the group chat. Um, but she recently decided, eh, you know what, fuck it, I'm gonna watch Teen Titans. Uh, and uh, me and then also my friend Maria were like, eh, we'd, we'd be down to watch that, we watched that growing up or whatever. Um, so I am like... Kind of rewatching Teen Titans, but it's also one of those things where it's like if they're watching, I'm just like, I don't need to be here every time I watch this once already as a kid. I'm just kind of fine seeing episodes here and there as like, you know, part of like a fun little trip down memory lane. Um, but so far I've seen, I want to say it's the first eight episodes of season one. That show holds up. I mean, like DC animated stuff from that time period generally is very well received, very mm-hmm. good. You know, I, I I watched Batman the Animated Series and Batman Beyond and Justice League yeah. and all that growing up. So um, I have fond memories of all this stuff. Um, but like it, it really, it's very fun revisiting the early episodes of Teen Titans and just being like, oh, they just like kind of had the formula down. Um, yeah. Like all, all of the early episodes are, they're doing a thing where it's either oh, the team can't work together because they're all young, hot-headed kids and they need to get over themselves and then they learn to work together. Or it's, oh, this member of the Teen Titans has a deep insecurity that they don't want to open up to their friends about. And then they open up to their friends about it so that they can, you know, get over themselves and defeat the villain. And everyone's very accepting and kind about it because they're good friends. Uh, It's just been good so far. Uh, I'm excited to... um, get to more episodes that I remember uh, because I, I remember a lot of cool stuff happening in that show that I, I just have like half baked memories of that don't entirely mm-hmm. um, like, I can't remember the full episode, but I remember individual moments and like little ideas. So revisiting stuff from childhood is good sometimes. Yeah, uh, It feels weird in our current era where the state of DC is like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it does feel like, and then like, late 90s early aughts they were doing pretty good shit in the animated sphere Mm -hmm. and now all those people are making their weird direct to dvd or i guess direct to streaming now uh animated stuff that is extremely hit or miss they had a good run there for a bit actually of like some of those got pretty good uh but then there's also ones where it's like oh you you just needed to you just needed something to fill a schedule. <laughs> um, yeah, DC's animated stuff always, yeah. always uh, interesting to take a look at, at the very least. Don't worry, just 
just just one more work where Superman is evil and they'll have it good. <laughs> just one more. <laughs> just one more, I swear. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, and if they yeah. if they ruin things, they can just do the, the Flash thing where uh, that everything gets reset and it's fine again. They should kill Flash so they can't do that anymore. That would be such a strong premise. Yeah, but then they CGI him back to life. <laughs> oh, damn. Um, what are we doing? It, I, As a society. Yeah. Why is the WB guy so hellbent on burning that Wile E. Coyote movie for tax write-off, even when given an offer for more money? Like, I don't understand. <laughs> Uh, it has to be that there's actually, like, a deep-seated personal beef with Mr. Wiley Coyote himself. Yeah. Speaking of Warner Brothers movies... What a segue. <laughs> so, uh, Dude Part 2 happened. It sure did. Now... I, I think you two have both seen it. Yes, you have not, I'm assuming. Nah, nah. Yeah, I, I, I didn't need to go to the theater. I just took the spice of the lounge and saw it all. Through the, <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, you just look into the future and say, I see what the movie's going to be. Yeah, I, I I was going to risk taking the water of life so I could see it. But then I was like, mm, I I don't like my odds. So, um, yeah, you might you might you might see the timeline where the adaptation is bad. Yeah, uh, uh, I so. Mel and I talked a little bit about this when we were streaming Tales of the Abyss. I don't think we want to go... Comp- we want to give people time to see the movie, so we're not going to go super in-depth, I think is where we're at with this, right, Mel? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, Editing Red here. Uh, while I would say the discussion of the movie is mostly broad, it's also in the context of all three of us having read the book at some point, and we reference it liberally all the time anyway, uh, so this discussion does inevitably get into the ideas of Dune and some specific ways the movie differs from the source material. So just a fair warning if you wanted to go into part two completely 100% blind, a discussion of the movie is over at 27 minutes and then there's just some general conclusions and a correction about the Herbert family. That's 27 minutes. Also, I was thinking that, like, I would have wanted to go more in depth. And, like, I don't feel like doing it in this format would be satisfactory. But you also said you didn't have it in you for a full spoiler cast. I don't so. I don't think I have enough thoughts on this movie for a full spoiler cast. Um, I feel my, like I do, but I don't want to be, like, solo carrying it. That'd be embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, so here's my thing. Is that what it comes down to is I like the movie a lot. And they they make adapt they make a lot more changes to the book than they did the in the first go around. Like yeah, part I, one is pretty close to the book. They cut some scenes. Uh, what were you saying, Mel? Yeah, I like there's some additions in the first half of this movie where it's just like, oh, this is a thing I don't think was in the book, but I think it's cool to see this side of like the Fremen society and the conflict. Yes. Um, um I, I feel like some of that is ideas from Messiah that they then decided to port backwards into this book. But, I mean, it is it is completely original. But, like, the Fremen feel more like an actual society with their own individual schisms and, like, different political and religious lines that they yeah. draw between themselves, which is very appreciated. I yeah, I very appreciate it. I appreciate the sort of, like, the actual grappling of the ideas of, like, the person who should free and lead the Fremen should ideally not be some foreign white guy. Yes. And that's a political opinion considered seriously, uh, especially by Johnny, who I think is better in perhaps this movie than in the book. I agree. That was one of my takeaways is I, I think I think Chani ends up being the best version of her is in this movie, which I was not expecting going in. Yeah. Uh, and just um, like the degree to which even if she's like Paul's true wife. Which they don't even they don't even have that line in the movie, which I think is appreciated Mm-mm. because that was one of the stupidest things I remember <laughs> when I was. Well, you like, mean you mean the literal very last last line yes, of the novel? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we we was, may be concubines, but they will remember us as wives. <laughs> um, that's that's court politics. Yeah. Yeah, and there's court politics. But yeah, I I like how she like even at the very end, as like Paul's true love there is the tension where she is like the one person who is against him becoming the savior 
And yes. him just kind of just like throwing himself into, well, I don't want to do this, but I kind of have to now. And just kind of like. I feel like it is a miracle we got the characterization we did for her be- in the modern Hollywood system. Because I feel like having her still be in love with him, but also in many ways his biggest critic, is so fucking galaxy brain. Uh, and I think they they managed to do both exceptionally well. Um, and it creates just a much richer character. Uh, I also think Lady Jessica was... A lot of people complain in the first movie that she feels, like, a lot more, like, weak and, like, played as, like, more scared and timid. And I do kind of... Honestly, I did kind of agree with that. I, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way how they portray her in the first movie. She is a force to be reckoned with in this movie in a terrifying way. Um, yeah, I think I was, they I was do very a good job of, well. like... It's not strictly, like, a criticism of Faith, per se, but it is, like what the Bene Gesserit have done and Jessica continues to do to the faith of the Fremen is a horrifying thing. Yes. Um, uh, I like how all the plant, how all the factions sort of have their own aesthetic. Like we get the house Corrin for the first time and they got, they got these weird silver fucking suits. Yeah. I, I, this goes back to the conversation actually we had last week. I am so happy that they're like every time we go to a different planet and like check in, it looks weird and different and unique, and it it's very good. That this movie did a much better job than the first than having about having memorable visuals uh, and things that are just going to stick in my brain as cool, evocative imagery yeah. uh, from like a sci fi universe. It, it, like, it did a lot better job. With I don't that. know the science behind why. Uh... The Harkonnen planet is in Kurosawa mode. Uh, however, <laughs> <laughs> however uh, it is very cool. Yeah, uh, I don't know why the Har- Harkonnens are fucking bald ass weirdos. Yeah, I don't either. I feel like when Fade Rotha is on screen and not talking or using a sword, he does the same mannerisms with his face the entire time. See, weirdly enough, I think this might be my favorite take on Fade. I think it's probably better. Then Sting, but... Yeah. Uh, oh, Dick, get, uh, also, get I, off this podcast. I, 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 also, <laughs> I, I also think that, like, he feels... He also feels like he's not in the movie enough compared to other versions of the story. Because he only shows up, like, he shows up, like, two-thirds the way through this movie. When I believe in, like, the original book, he's, like, more of a presence even in the first half of the story. He is, um, but I don't feel like he gets like he's kind of in the Harkonnen scenes as like a background like whiny kid. <laughs> it feels yeah. like more. Um, I think they did a good job of setting him up as a dark mirror of what Paul could be. Yeah, um, I just feel like when the final fight happens, it does feel like I think I've seen like twenty minutes of this guy at most, <laughs> and it feels like I, I, if you, I feel like the the site the fight at the end is sick, but I also feel like. It hit a bit more if he was in the movie a bit more, even though I don't know necessarily what he'd do. Yeah, I, I I can see that. I I feel like the way they the way they depicted him as like a violent like a, as one of the Harkonnens, I feel like gave him more. I don't know if I want to say more character, but he felt more grounded in a way compared to even like I mean I I, I said this last time. One of my criticisms of Dune is I just think the Harkonnens are boring villains. They're just comically evil for the sake of it. Yeah, they're just like, oh man, I'm gonna cut this person's throat just because. Uh, yeah. I'm just like, I don't know how they're able to run the society. And I mean, to some degree, <laughs> which it's like, true life can surprise you. Like, you know, slave societies are uh, notoriously horrendous uh, and mm-hmm. evil. But also, like, it does feel Ta- weird. You can, you can... Uh, uh, living in the uh, continued uh, uh, monarchy, um, you can work with tyrants. You like, you know, so so long as so long as you know they're tyrants and they're not like unpredictable, um, you can you can you can get by. <laughs> um, I, I, I think they did a good job of making fade like they show clearly like he is. He has no remorse or, like, he's horrible and treats everyone terribly, and he would be a horrible ruler for this planet. But then they also give him this weird sense of, like, 
warrior's honor that I feel like is kind of there in the book, but they kind of, I think, bring to the forefront more to make it feel like, okay, so he is like the other Harkonnens that we've seen before, but there's like, there's something about this guy that in a way makes him both more honorable, but also more terrible uh, that, that I kind of, I kind of liked how, uh, I think it's Austin Baker's the actor's name, uh, d- uh, played him. Austin something. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, the, the only other, this is actually my main takeaway from this movie. Um, and I want to keep it broad, I guess, is I feel like if you gave me a piece of paper prior to me seeing this movie with a bulleted list of all the things they changed from the book, I would be like, oh, they're cowards. What are they doing? I'm going to hate this. But then actually seeing the movie, not knowing those things and just experiencing it as a movie, I went, oh, no, you you made changes for reasons and they worked out pretty well. Um and I'm very curious what Denise, uh version of Messiah looks like. They're taking uh, a break, it sounds like, but in a few yeah. years, whenever they get that going, uh, I'm very excited to see Messiah. Yeah, so. um, I think the worm riding scene is sick. Yes. I was popping off so much uh, for that. Oh, I have um, actually, I have, can I can I do one one acting complaint and then I I think I'm done. Is it Christopher thoughts. Walken? Yes. <laughs> You cast you cast the fucking emperor of the I didn't so here's the thing I actually didn't really look too much into this movie so like you know there was one actor jump scare that I was like oh I I like that actor like I, I like that actor emperor? a lot it was cool seeing her yes the, the emperor's emperor Christopher Walken is Christopher Walken okay it's, it's so, so distracting funny. It, it's it so is. distracting every time he's on screen I cannot take it seriously I, it's I my one he, complaint yeah, with I don't the think he necessarily does movie. a bad job but because it's Christopher Walken it fucking takes out the movie because it's Christopher <laughs> he, Walken. he takes me he takes me out every fucking time he's on screen I'm like that's just fucking Christopher Walken in stupid emperor robes shut the fuck up I hate it I anyone else just anyone else I could not deal with it damn <laughs> That's the man in charge of the, is, you know, that's the man what made the, the Sadaka. Yeah. <laughs> Christopher Walken Sadaka. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, it is a crime. We never heard Christopher Walken have to say the phrase Salusa Secundus. <laughs> that is a crime. Yeah. Um, it is funny just that there's this one Fat Boy Slim song uh, called Weapon of Choice. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Christopher Walken bounce around a hotel, but one of the lyrics is like a Dune reference. <laughs> uh, it's like walk without rhythm, so you don't attract the worm. Oh, it's just it's just as funny. Yes, it is. <laughs> oh, I hadn't thought of that. That's really funny. <laughs> I, I I don't I don't know if I had any role in things, but I do like the idea of fake inspiring to put Christopher Walken in this movie. I mean, considering song. the first trailer song they picked was because of the fucking Pink Floyd thing and Jodorowsky's Dune, I could see some asshole being like, "Hey, wait a minute, <laughs> what if um, we got?" <laughs> uh, but yeah, I do like the ending of this movie because it does a good job of uh, setting up, like logically why like paul's jihad would happen which they're still dodging that word which also made me a little bit mad yeah that's the other thing like i think like all of the they don't but the but the butlerian jihad i don't even think they say that in the movie you have to talk about you have to talk about jihad in june in dune that's you have to do that Uh, if they if they bring up the word jihad i think it's only i think it's i think it might I don't even know if they re- reference that, honestly. Yeah, I think um, like, I think like the um, if the next movie comes out and they call it a crusade, that's it. Yeah, it's, it's true. This true coward. They, they really, they really like to say holy war. Oh, coward! Yeah, yeah, like um, they um, fuck. What was I going to say? Oh, Something sorry, about the ending, it. setting it up. Oh yeah, yeah. Just like them doing what they did for, like, I guess you say decolonization and self determination of the Fremen, like that political position by the Fremen society, as opposed to like you know white savior Paul. That the idea, I as much as I appreciate that conflict is undercut by the fact that they cut out uh, actual Arabic for a con oh, yes. that is used <laughs> extensively in this movie in the Fremen scenes. Yeah, it, it did take me out of it. Just knowing, like, you're you're doing the correct ideas, but the fact that you like are cutting out the actual linguistic reference mm-hmm. because you're cowards uh, is upsetting. Yeah, 
Wow. Uh, but yeah, I do think I do agree. Like, I did notice the changes in emissions. Like, oh, this character is uh, only in this particular context, uh, or this character uh, doesn't have a conflict with another character. I'll just put them as spoilers in the chat, just so like we don't actually say it, but you know. Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh, I see. Those are those are some of the changes in the the movie. But I thought like you know what this mm. is fine. Oh. Ooh. Yeah. That sec- Ooh, that second one's okay. Hey, that second one when I said that thing about the piece of paper with the bulleted list, that second one was the one that was top of my mind, Red. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it actually works. That's... It actually works for me well. They still they still make that character work yes. uh, okay. in the context. Um, okay. Also, <laughs> that one is completely useless, so it's not bad that they cut it. <laughs> huh? Yeah. Oh right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. I that is so. Uh, that is so cuttable that I had kind of forgot that happened. Yeah. I forgot about it even when I was like after I listened to the audiobook the first time. I was like, wait, it happened? What? <laughs> Uh, it makes sense. Yeah, there, there's definitely aspects of that second part of that novel that like you do not necessarily need to hold on to for. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. I, in general, I just think the adaptation overall did fairly strong job at uh, highlighting and focusing in on the things I personally find very interesting about Dune and uh, trying to extrapolate from what they have to work with in the setting. Um. Cool. Not perfect, but very yeah. good. I'm very happy with it. I hope. I would be surprised I... if this is not the best movie I've seen all I see all year. <laughs> so, Wait, Wait, so many Godzilla freedom. movies to watch though. Oh, Seed oh. Freedom. Uh, yeah, true. Uh, I hope uh, that someone gets to do someone competent gets to do Children and God Emperor after. Uh. I want to see Jason Momoa's healthy career. <laughs> Duncan. Duncan, oh Duncan. If they somehow got far enough to do the Kevin J. Anderson and uh, Brian... Oh, also, actually, I need... <sighs> Ruffians, there's been a misunderstanding. Uh, oh, last misunderstanding. Week... <laughs> last week, oh, no. I... I misidentified Brian Herbert as the gay son that Frank Herbert disowned. Uh, Brian Herbert being the one who works with Kevin J. Anderson to carry on the legacy of Dune novels. Uh, I was incorrect, and I was conflating what I had read in a opening, like a little preface that um, Brian Herbert wrote in one of the releases of Dune, where he talks about how he had a a somewhat stressful relationship with his father at times because he felt like he cared more about his writing and his work than being able to give him the time of day as, like, a son or to his family. Um, and I had conflated that with the fact that he very much so disowned his gay son, Bruce Herbert, who went on to be a LGBTQ activist and then, I believe, died young. So, Damn. Unfortunately. Yeah. 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 Sorry about that. That's kind of an important thing to get wrong, so <laughs> I feel yeah. bad. But, um, oh, well. All so right. it goes. Can't Dune remember is... everything perfectly. Dune is complicated. Yeah. Yes. Uh, that's all I had. Mel, do you have anything else? Yeah, I mean, I, w- I watched another short movie that I also don't want to get too much into spoilers for. Uh, but I saw the just recently subbed Fi's 20th anniversary movie, Paradise Regained. <laughs> Such a good title. <laughs> I'm uh, going to guess from the broad things that I saw on your Twitter um you really liked it <laughs> yeah it was good <laughs> in a way it was cooking how um, now how long ago was the last fies thing because it's been a minute right uh so it's weird because there was the show uh and then fies in like in the 2010s just showed up in a bunch of crossover stuff which did weird character references like they did more with the character than you'd expect in a crossover thing which i think is interesting uh also completely at odds with the plot that actually happens in the show, but don't worry about that. Um, but yeah, so this is like, I think and the first... And Fies itself was like early 2000s, yeah, right? Yeah, Fies was... So it's been a minute. Fies is 2003. So okay. yeah, 20th anniversary. Um, it's like the fourth Heisei era show. Uh, so after Yuki. Uh, weirdly enough... 
Uh, they got Inoue to do a show two years after he did another show there. Uh, but anyway, mm-hmm. he came back from the, this movie fresh off of Don Brothers. Uh, I was I was a bit trepidatious at originally at first uh, when they announced the movie because I think Fize has a really strong ending that's kind of like both ambiguous but has finality to it um and you you feel like making more of it kind of narrows down yeah yeah uh but i do think it's like they did a good job with like this movie being like a distant finale also being like well you can still take the original show as is uh while also going into this one like being like oh here's like a one way the future could have gone worth noting that uh, despite the title, it doesn't have any plot connection to the Fi summer movie, Paradise Lost. Oh my uh, god. <laughs> which, I, which I've talked about in this podcast previously. Uh, yeah. Uh, that one was like a weird... Because that was a weird thing in that era of Kamen Rider where the summer movie would be a movie they air that came out halfway through the show's run, but would be an alternate ending to the show and would spoil stuff from the show that hadn't aired yet. That's so weird. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like, well, I'm not going to watch these movies until after I finish the show. But yeah, it's bizarre. Uh, but I will say there's like thematic uh, stuff going on with the titles because in Paradise Lost, it's like a world where the monsters of the week, the Orphanox, uh, have conquered the world and humans are in like, mm-hmm. uh, like in hiding. Uh, and here in this timeline, it's like the humans are doing like uh, the, go- the Japanese government specifically is like trying to eliminate all the Orphanox uh, instead of like, you know, we could live in peace kind of thing. So it's interesting reversion. Um, uh, there's an original new female writer whose weird gimmick is uh, acting like when people watch her transformed, she has the emotional reaction as if she's undressing. I'm like, why would you do this? Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I don't know what they're doing. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think there's I don't want to spoil it, obviously, because one, uh, some people here have not watched Fries and may want to in the future. Um, but I think they did a good job of being like, well, here's why making the fate of this character in this shit movie, who you might not have expected to be here, makes sense. Uh, there's an absolute ridiculous twist at the end with respect to one of those characters. Uh, one of the most absurd and coolest scenes I've ever seen. Uh, <laughs> uh, completely ridiculous. I don't know how to say it, but I won't. Uh, despite. Uh, also, one of the most big-brained, bizarre choices to put uh, in a movie as sort of like an advancement of their relationship. Uh, but I applaud the effort. Uh, and Excellent. yeah, it was just like... Me as someone who's like, that's my favorite second Conrader show and one of my favorite Toki shows. I was clapping uh, just seeing all the the stuff, the beats hit, uh, the choices made. And yeah, it's, uh, it's just good. If you like that show, you will like this movie, I think. If you're just like in the minds, just like, oh yeah, I like the brain poison given to me by Inoue, then you'll, then you'll like this. Sick. Yeah. I also just gave like a brief, uh, a sidewinder, in addition because uh, I also before immediately before recording I watched the first episode of Boon Boomcher. Uh, oh, the, yeah, the new one, the wheel one, the new Sentai the car one. Yeah, I I hope I hope the suit actors are sleeping well because they look tired. Okay. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh. Yeah, I, I, I really like this first episode. I really like what they're doing. Um, uh, they they really this, like what they're doing? Um, <sighs> I deserve that. Uh, <laughs> I can't complain after what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, have, we have to keep this rolling. Uh, this is a good this is a good run for the podcast, everyone. Uh, thank you all for listening. I'm sorry it ended like this. <laughs> now, now, not to gas up a show was just the first episode. Way. <laughs> uh, uh, but yeah, I like. Yeah, they're 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 trying something new, uh, a new filming technique called real sets, 
uh, on location. Oh, it's I really like what they're <laughs> I like what they're doing. I don't think that'll catch on. <laughs> I like what it brings to the table. <laughs> um, I like it as a really ridiculous setup. Um, the first the episode begins with like the Red Ranger crashing a wedding and kidnapping the bride. Uh, and the bride's like, who are you? And he's like, I'm a delivery man. <laughs> Cut the title. Uh, and the first episode revolves around the plot of, like, Red and Blue run a sort of, like, a weird delivery company, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, and his job was to kidnap the reluctant wife of this rich guy, uh, and deliver her to the airport so she can elope with her secret boyfriend. Uh, okay. And and then through the course of this episode, as things happen, as like these aliens show up and start doing, uh, you know, turning inanimate objects into monsters, and then those monsters attack people and then use uh, their negative emotions to power up, like Precure or something. Uh, <laughs> Damn. Uh, as as this unfolds, uh, the bride in question starts like you know going actually fuck uh both the men in my life for kind of trying to control my life i'd rather do this superhero shit and then she becomes the pink ranger uh, and it's good uh and yeah it is uh the the villains are pretty here coded and i like that going back to very traditional sentai style with like the kill the monster uh then the monster goes big uh, and they do the robot fight uh, the robot fight looks good. It reminds me of, like, you know, an Ultraman set, the way they're doing things, which is nice. We've been doing mm -hmm. a lot of CG stuff in recent years with the robot fights. Uh. Like, even Dawn Brothers was, like, in real life for most of it, but the robot fights themselves were, like, in a CG location. So, um, and then, like, yeah, there's also, like, a weird CG, like, Mario Kart segment in between when the monster dies and when the monster grows big. Because I guess it's like, ah, oh, it's racing. Uh, but yeah, so far, I like the the energy of the show. It's it's silly, it's lighthearted. Um, Pink is just so enthusiastic about being a superhero, and I am here for it. Cool. Yeah, it's fun. I'm looking forward to the year ahead. Yeah. Sick. Sen Sentai, con Sentai continues to do well. Yeah. All right. But one day I might be able to tell you how gosh it is. <laughs> yeah, one well, maybe. Who knows? Maybe. Who knows? The show's like halfway done. I've seen one episode. Um, I I am all right with Carmen Rider just not making any more good Carmen Rider because there's already too much to watch. Um, I just said you know I have to catch up, but I I don't have to catch up. But I you know I I want to watch the good <laughs> ones, but you know if they if they keep making ones and some of them are good. That sucks. Yeah. Don't do that. Well, I'll, I'm behind I'll over let, here. I'll let you in on a on a secret. Yeah. Uh, of like the past four years, uh, Geeks mm -hmm. is the only one I can say. Yeah, I was okay. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> that's good. That's good news to me. Fantastic. Um. All right. Do we have anything else before we go into? motherfucking return of ultraman that is a no yeah I, yeah no i think maybe we should fill it in with like another 45 more minutes of stuff yeah i you know this feels so a little quick <laughs> this feels like really short um all do right you get, do you, you want to hear about my taxes <laughs> uh yeah all about no um <laughs> episode 34 of the return of ultraman is called now according to my title the life that can't be forgiven. Uh, an unforgiven life. I like yours better this time. Yeah. Okay. Featuring, and I know that this translation is wrong as well, Combat compatibility monster Leogon. No, oh, that good. was what we had too. Oh, okay. All right. I also disagree. Like, I, or, I, I, I disagree with that epithet. Compatibility okay. monster is weird. Tokyo is at peace, and Matt finds themselves with little to do. Uh, but don't worry, that peace won't last as a strange signal coming from the, uh, there's a strange signal coming from somewhere in the Sakata's neighborhood. A man named Mizuno 
stops by at Ken's place to request the construction of an instrument that will help him with his experiments. Uh, Go stops by at about the same time, and it turns out that he and Mizuno are childhood friends. A lot has changed since then, though. Uh, these days, Go is in Matt, and Mizuno is a celibate, fatherless biologist. Uh, later, Ken sends Jiro to deliver the instrument to Mizuno, and Mizuno uh, lets Jiro look around at all the plants and reptiles he has. Uh, Mizuno then starts pop like absolutely just like losing it about how it's his duty to blur the line between plants and animals because in nature everything is supposed to be the same, apparently. Uh, yeah, I'm, Jiro... I'm, I'm sh yeah. N n natural scientists being like, yeah, I think speciation and biodiversity is a crime. <laughs> uh, Jiro finds this very alarming and leaves Mizuno to his own devices uh, for instance his device that shoots alpha waves to blend flora and fauna uh, he shoots this at an egg and when it hatches it's like what if Blastoise was a grass type um, uh, I was watching this episode with friends and verbatim one of them said that exact phrase <laughs> I mean, it's just true that's just it what is it is true yeah. It's Venus Stoys. It's Venus Stoys. Uh, he names this creature Laogon and brags to the painting of his dead father that he has now created new life. There's some uh, hang ups about the whole celibacy thing happening here. Uh, <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if that's intentional on his part. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, this new life grows very quickly and escapes in the night. Laogon appears at Jiro's window and scares him. Jiro goes to Mizuno. Well, first he like is like crying to Ken, like, "Well, there was a monster at my window," and Ken's like, "Oh, it was probably just a big lizard." Uh, Once again, people refusing to believe kaiju are real. <laughs> Ken should Jiro know better. Ken should know better. Jiro goes to Mizuno, and Mizuno's response is not, "Oh no, Legon escaped and spooked you." Mizuno's response is to threaten to kill him with cobra venom if he tells anyone about this. Um, <laughs> Laogon has grown to giant size and starts causing havoc in Tokyo. Um, Matt deploy uh, to fight it, but have trouble with the weird tentacle cannons on its back. They later analyze the material of the tentacles and discover oh, they're not tentacles, they're vines. What is this? Some kind of plant-animal hybrid? Y yes, yes it is. Uh, at the Sakata's place, uh, Go finds out Jiro has been behaving weirdly for days. It takes some persuading, but desperate for help, Jiro tells Go about Mizuno. Uh, Go confronts Mizuno um, and has to make him face the consequences of his... I'm, I'm being very broad here. Uh, Go confronts Mizuno and has to make him face the consequences of his actions. People are dying. Can anything be done about Laogon? And uh, wrestling with his emotions, Mizuno admits that, yes, if we shot Laogon with beta waves, it would destroy the creature. Uh, so Matt and Mizuno work together to set up the operation at the side of the lake where Laogon is. But at the last moment, as Mizuno is meant to pull the trigger and destroy Laogon, his love for the life he created overwhelms him, and he wades into the lake yelling for Laogon. Uh, Go dives in to try to save his friend, and over a montage of their childhood friendship, we get an insert song that is abruptly ended when Laogon's vine snatches Mizuno from the water and just sucks him up. Um, that's it. Bye-bye, uh, Mizuno. Fucking rip. Uh... Go turns into Ultraman and we have a big fight that ends with, like, I think someone pulls the trigger on the thing, and uh, the explosion of Laogon. And this, uh, naturally, also, concurrently, the explosion of Mizuno. Uh, and the insert song resumes. Uh, it's a sad day for Go, who has lost his weird friend. Uh, the moral lesson, if you're gonna be celibate in a, like, kind of maybe gay way, do not try too hard to compensate at uh, the end. Oh, you forgot the part where like his house got turned into a museum. Oh, I did. I did forget that part. Yes, he his house got turned into a uh, a museum and like a playground for children as well. Yeah, it was like it was like a museum for children for animals. Yeah, and then uh, and then um, and Jiro and like then throws Jiro, the yeah. throws the like the this this the stand into the fire. Yes, and burns it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Rip Mizuno, you were kind of strange. It is a weird one. Uh, yeah. How do you feel about this episode? Uh, 
I liked it with the caveat if this was this is one of those times where I feel like the episodic format hurts a little bit because if this was someone we had known for a bit, I think I would have maybe cared a little bit more yeah. when he died. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um and I do wonder if that's just like the expectations of the time, because like the way this is considered one of the the masterpiece episodes. Uh so it obviously resonated with people mm-hmm. at the time. Uh I think, like, maybe just, like, expectations yeah. of... Mm-hmm. Yeah, just I also a... think if you're if you're going to have the big dramatic, like, thing for the episode be like, oh, no, this, like, his friend died, I would maybe give us more reasons to like him as a person, because I... Lol. <laughs> yeah, we get, we get, like, one scene of him being friends with the Go, and, like, three scenes of him being weird and antagonistic <laughs> yeah. to Jiro. <laughs> It was just like five minutes ago, you strangled a child. We, we all now, saw this. Now, as we, as we know from episode 31, sometimes it can be endearing when the hero uh, assaults a child. But Yes, stra- strang- strangling kids is, is sometimes fine. It really depends yeah. on the context. Um, yeah, like The Simpsons. Oh, yeah. I did out of context also show my friends the scene of the child getting shot in the throat. They had a good time with that. Excellent. Good time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, so... Yeah, Mizuno has, like, the the most that, that we get out of Mizuno is, like, him, like, clawing at, like, this old photo of what... The, at first, I was like, I don't know who this is a photo of. This could be any... This is a photo of a child. This could be you. This could be Go. This could be anyone. Um, and then, it, you know, it turns out to be him, I think. Um, that was my read as well. Uh, based on the flashback. Um, and, you know, like I kind of included in my summary, I was like, this this feels like the tiniest, tiniest hint of gay in here, um, in, like, like this kind of strange way, um, but, like, you know, that's not, like, I'm not, that's not, like, a, that's not me, I'm not being, like, very serious about that, necessarily, um, yeah, I, I'm a little, I'm a little up in the air this episode. Yeah, I feel like this is kind of a. This is an episode that's like I think the way it's directed maybe is like it's punching above its weight because I feel like on paper it's not an amazing episode, mm-hmm. but I think they do a good job of like making engaging to watch, even if it's like you know, yeah, not amazing. I'd also say uh, this feels like. Uh, uh, like I guess a more ground, not grounded, but like more serious. Go at like the Jiras episode. Go at the Jiras episode. I'm altering. Yeah, which one? Which the one with the weird dinosaur guy? Yes. Oh right, yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, it's been a while since we've had like mad scientist guy be the cause for the issue. I feel like. Mm-hmm. You haven't had that really in Return of Ultraman, even I think so far. Yeah, I do. You know, I do. I do like a. I do like a, a science science experiment gone wrong. I do like it. Um, or has I it gone horribly right? Oh, it's got, oh, it's got. He was right. Life should all be the same thing. Na- Suck it, Dad. Yeah. Um, Dad was disappointed in me. Um, that is a terrible painting, by the way. I just want to point it's that a, out. It's a really funny painting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he keeps yelling at his dad through this painting he has of him uh, in his fucking rich person house. And it, it it looks like a very amateur painter did that painting. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. Like the, yeah, like the, like the woman who fixed that Christ painting. Yeah. <laughs> Alright. Um, would it surprise you to learn that this episode was written by a 16-year-old? Okay, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I'm completely honest... Oh, well, no, hang on. Yes, it does. Because the whole celibacy thing is just... what. Would it surprise you to learn that this was originally drafted by a 16 year old and then touched up by another writer we've talked about before okay okay now now (laughs) now it makes a little now everything's kind of coming together um 
So yeah, this was directed by uh, known Aum Shinrikyo fan uh, Eizo Yamagiwa, and then written by newcomer Shinichiro Kobayashi and Toshiro Ishido, who you may remember we talked about. He's the Bone God Oxter guy. Mm -hmm. Um, Also did a few other things, like the weird constellation, like Big Dipper's missing episode. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, The thing with the disappearing airplanes. Uh, You know, he's he's been around. Um, Now, uh, background on Kobayashi, our newcomer here. Uh, Significant... Um, because this is the only episode he worked on for Return of Ultraman. He was actually he was 16. 16. <laughs> he was a 16-year-old high school student at the time. One day, he hit up Subaraya Productions and submitted 13 monster designs and several story pitches, uh, and asked if any of them were, you know, good enough to be used. And they selected, like, hey, we actually think this one's pretty good, and decided to take his original draft for this episode, have it touched up by, uh, Toshiro Ishido. Uh, and, um, yeah, he got his start as a weird amateur, uh, kaiju story writer. Um, notably, um, he would go on in life to become a dentist, and I guess he's actually a, um, like, part-time professor at some dental university now. Um, so he has credit for the original draft on this episode, um, this same story pitch that he sent to Subaraya Productions, he would rework and send in again for a fan Godzilla story pitch contest, with the winner being, like, you know, they would use the pitch for their next movie. It won, and became the story for the movie Godzilla vs. Biolante. <laughs> so, Damn. And this is where um, I say that... The context for the Twitter joke I made where I said this episode is uh, the R War game of Ultraman. I see. It's, uh, yeah, it, 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 so whenever we get around to watching more Godzilla, we will see the, the broad framework of the story again, I'm sure. Yeah, the Summer um, Wars of Godzilla. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I guess also, too, in, in addition to his dental work, Every now and again, he does contribute to specifically the kaiju genre. He has credits on Mirror Man and several other Godzilla movies for, like, story concepts and ideas. So he's around, but he, this is not his main thing. This is a side hustle for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, he's out here fixing people's teeth. So. Yeah. Damn. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, apparently, apparently the... Uh... This is part where I slide in my trivia. Yeah. Um, and also I must apologize to everyone. Uh, we found out last week that may- maybe it's a bit too much to do. Bios for everyone. Uh, <laughs> so I'm gonna crank that down a bit. I'm mean, also do stuff. I'll give trivia and maybe yeah, some yeah. broad career stuff yeah. if appropriate. If the guy is significant enough, but uh, I will not go as in depth for literally every guy uh especially because my source is deep l Jap- japanese wikipedia uh you can see here also a brief uh draft design uh of the kaiju up in the top which is supposed to be originally supposed to be like a cross between bemular and a pitcher plant okay uh, however yonatani who took the the design from kobayashi and turned it into a new thing uh he was like I know this kaiju is going to be in the water. So making a biped is the correct decision. Lol. However, <laughs> however, uh, I think the episode's special effects director can handle it. And so he made it a quadruped. Uh, wow. I'm going to say I don't really know if he could handle it. It looks a little weird yeah. when it's poking out of the water at an angle because they... <laughs> Yeah, I think that I would have just made it a pipe. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this also part kind, where it's, just kind, it's just kind of rude to just be like, yeah, like I'll, it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is part where I also find... I'm making find... your life harder because I believe in you. <laughs> yeah. This is part where I also found out, oh, special effects directors are like a thing and are kind of like the third major person alongside the writer and the director. So I'm also going to talk about them more because uh, I feel like, well, if they're listed along those other two... Uh, they should talk about it a bit. Uh, so on that note, the the episode special effects director for this episode was uh, Kazuo Sagawa, who 
previously he he's done he's the special effects director for all three episodes this week so got that off the bat uh but also he's done uh the episode he's he was the he start he got a start uh in this show with episode 13 and 14 the tsunami tornado two-parter uh he's also done episode 18 which is fuck the one also seven shows up Episode 19, 22, 23, 28, and 29. Uh, so yeah, he's he's contributing a bit to the show. Uh, he apparently started as an assistant cinematographer on Ultra Q. Uh, and then became a cameraman in Ultraman. His actual debut as a special effects director was in Mighty Jack. Uh, but his debut for the Ultra series was Turn of Ultraman. Uh, in the 80s, he'd go on to do some work for Toei. Uh, but he was still doing like super ass stuff when they started doing stuff again in the 90s apparently he's called flying sagawa because of his dynamic style in terms of like special effects director stuff i want to um, have a nickname like that uh, <laughs> his experience like with camera work helps like you know inform his directorial decisions because you know he has more of a sense of how to shoot stuff yeah. Uh, he's also apparently the kind of guy who would push things to the limit, which could create problems. Like, uh, apparently, I saw an anecdote where, oh, he'd blow all the budget on special effects in the first few episodes of the show, or return movies uh, very, very close to the deadline. So, mm-hmm. you know, uh, that's that's our guy, Sagawa, apparently. Nice. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, you know, once again, suit actor is Takenob Toya. And yeah, Yonatani punched up uh, Kopiashi's design. Cool. Uh, I I so we there's a there's a licensed insert song in this episode. Yes, which that uh, I found some dumb trivia for. <laughs> oh, did you? I will also just slot in right here that uh, for the past few weeks ish, Sidejixer has been very <laughs> keen to let me know that uh, there was a song coming up for this episode. And he has provided for me. Uh, uh, th- so, uh, thank, thank you, Cydrixer. I was going to grab it, but as you provided <laughs> it, <laughs> so don't worry, uh, listener. He, you will be hearing he's the this music song. guy. So, <laughs> so this song is called. So I guess I should start. It's by Japanese rock band PYG. Mm-hmm. The name of the song is "Flower Sun Rain." Now that makes you think of a certain adventure game. It makes me think of a certain adventure game, so I went, there's no fucking way. So I found this interview uh, from, oh shoot, what's the, uh, this is from the WordPress blog DJ Translations, DJ, D-I-G-E-H, like the Can I just say, can I, can I just say, when you Google <laughs> Flower, Sun, and Rain, the little, the little, like, collage of images that come up, one of them is just Austin Walker's face. <laughs> That's perfect. Um, so this is a this is a translation blog post from a 2001 interview, um, and the the person asked, "How did you come up with the title Flower, Sun, and Rain?" Um, Suda responds, "The original idea was Flower and Sun, and I wasn't sure whether to add another word or not. At some point, I happened to read a magazine for young people, and I saw the words Flower, Sun, Rain, which made a really strong impression on me." There was an interview with Kishibi uh, Itoku about a song he had written. I had to look for the original song, only knowing that it was the song of a band called PYG. And then he goes on to explain that, uh, yeah, he he basically, he took the name of the game from the song, and he hopes that uh, players of the game become more uh, more aware of the band and the song because of them looking stuff up about the game. Uh... Thank you, Suda. Um, that's yeah. not that's not how I found out about the song. Uh, but you no. know we're here now. <laughs> <laughs> what a weird crossroad of interests. <laughs> yeah, I actually don't know anything about the game. Uh, myself, I need to beat that game. I it very very. I, I love Suda. I I I, I didn't even know it was a Suda game. Adventure I just know that stuff. some people we know did LPs of it. But you know. mm-hmm. yeah. Um. I will also add, this reminds me of how, like, Call of the Night was named after a song that guy really liked. <laughs> and then they, I, used it in the, uh, then they used it as the AD for the anime. I, I'm gonna be honest, good good taste guy. 
I like watched like, that ED. I was like, this, 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 this bangs. This is good. Yeah, it's funny when that stuff like that happens. Um, so uh, we, I, I think we still got a, a, a little bit to squeeze out of this episode because, like, uh, first of all, um, the actual moment of the insert song is, uh. It's this very funny thing where it hits and I'm like, hell yeah, let's go. And then <laughs> this amazing moment where it completely undercuts it by killing Mizuno and then waits until the kaiju has exploded to resume the insert song. <laughs> yep. And it's so fun. I was like, this is I also such like, a uh, baffling choice. <laughs> I also like how it cuts it off at the end because it has to do, it has to fade out the song that's playing for like the end of the episode song. Yes, it does. <laughs> It's, oh. it's never it's never not jarring when they do that it's like the um uh this is uh, this is uh, this is some uh, information that you that you only really learn if you uh, watch all of clone wars which no one should do don't don't do that to yourself uh but if you watch all of clone wars there's an episode there's a really like there's an episode where they actually pay off on stuff like emotionally at the end and they don't cut to the Star Wars uh, theme for the credits the way that they usually do. Um, and uh, it's, you know, oh, revolutionary. You don't have to end on this huge triumphant blare of horns. <laughs> um, it's, uh, you know. I, my so, favorite thing is when the Precure episodes end with, like, an emotional gut punch. Uh, and then it cut, immediately cuts to the part where they start CG dancing to happy music. Yes. <laughs> it's yes. good every time. Man. There, there was another one that was good that I wish I had the clip for where uh, in Zhuoger, uh, which is a Sentai from like a while ago, out, um, mm -hmm. there was a scene where it looks like where like the Red Ranger screams out in agony as he thinks like all of his teammates are dead. Uh, and then it cuts the commercial break from McDonald's. <laughs> Fantastic. Stellar stuff. Hunter, I believe the I believe the the uh, newer Hunter Hunter anime uh, is uh, an infamous uh, culprit of this kind of thing, um, with characters getting killed off and then cutting to really like fun EDs. <laughs> um, newer right, because well, uh, it's only ten years old as opposed to twenty. <sighs> I didn't like that. <laughs> I, I, uh, I didn't like that one. I didn't like that one. Uh, yeah, yeah. God damn. Anyway, uh, yeah. This 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 kaiju is just fucking Blastoise. Yeah, it's a it's got the the, the cannons on the back. It shoots vines. Um, I do like it. I think it's cool. Yeah. It's, it's, I do like the right. second where they like they have the vines and they have to like do science on it. Yeah, I the do like. Go goes like, hey, can you analyze this? You're good with this shit, and then he's just like, uh, yes, locks the door. <laughs> yeah, I like <laughs> the cut from when the the vine hits the plane, and then it's like freeze frame, and it turn and it cuts to like it's reveals it to be like projected image of them looking at the footage and going like, man, that was a close call. <laughs> yeah, because, the, I mean, they set up that, like, Oka and someone else are, like, out on the side taking pictures of the fight so they could, like, analyze it better. Yeah. Like, before they go out. Yeah, that that was neat. That was cool. They, 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 they have... Return of Ultraman's always having fun like this. They're always doing stuff like this. Mm -hmm. um, do we have anything more about episode 34, The Life That Can't Be Forgiven? Uh, I think this is the weakest of November's masterpieces. Yeah. Uh, Mizuno, uh, you know, I, you get out. You meet some people. <laughs> I, <laughs> I don't think this is healthy. Um, all right. Episode 35. You imagine, imagine now, oh, uh, Mizuno at a party and it's like the Scott Pilgrim shot where he talks about Sonic. Uh, <laughs> except he's talking about why plants and animals should be the same. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, okay. Episode 35. Now, this episode is a fucking master. Anyway. Uh, cruel. 
Light Monster Prisma. I bet that's not the title. Yeah, that's it. No, a... a... Holy shit. Featuring Light Monster Prisma. Um... Lighthouses and ships are disappearing entirely in the night. A fog rapidly descends upon them, and then they vanish in a flash of searing white light. Uh, there's no solid evidence it's kaiju-related, but Go is certain. Uh, Matt isn't going to act, so Go will have to act on his own. At the Sakata house, uh, Ken and Jiro keep demonstrating a bunch of physics lessons about light and prisms and lenses and glasses breaking if you pour hot water into them. Um, it's at this point that I think... Where's Aki? Where yeah, this last see her. <laughs> last thing, I, last time we saw her was the Beetle episode, uh, which I think was a while ago. Episode twenty six. Yeah, oh it was like God. ten episodes ago. She's just not been in the show. Yeah. Did they break up? Oh no! <laughs> this, wait, hang on, hang on. They break up and she gets kicked out of the house. <laughs> Yeah. Ken's like, nah, I prefer, I'm gonna be honest, I prefer Go. Go is go, go like, I, go, go is like, I'm keeping your siblings in the divorce. Yes. <laughs> Man, it, it has been up. weird because we've, we've actually been getting like lots of decent episodes, like well, a decent number of episodes where like Ken and Jiro are heavily involved in the plot and yeah. like relevant. Yeah. And that's been good, but also Aki is here and it, it not here and it feels very weird. It's, yeah. it's strange, especially because we were praising that last episode with Aki going like, finally. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're actually dating. a couple. It matters now. We're not, we're not getting the weird shit where like Aki is passively, aggressively weird about her feelings with Go as if they aren't a couple, which apparently yeah. they were. And Go is like oblivious to this. Yeah. Um, um, anyway. Anyway, where is Aki? Uh, if you've seen, if you have seen uh, Aki around, uh, let us know. Uh, she has to come home safe. Um, Go turns up and shows Ken that he's plotted all the disappearances on a map, starting in the Antarctic and heading towards Japan. Go and Ken estimate the most likely lighthouse in Japan to be targeted first and head there to watch it overnight, see if anything happens. They tell Jiro to stay home, but he sneaks into the trunk of the car. Night falls, and Go and Ken watch as the fog rolls in, and Ramiel from Neon Genesis Evangelion appears. Uh, this bum, is bum, 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 bum. <laughs> this is Prisma, a weird crystal kaiju that sings and seems to turn things into light and then absorb them. Uh, for instance, this lighthouse, which it eats. Uh, Jiro, at this point, reveals himself to have been in the car the whole time, and he appears with a flashlight, which bothers Prisma. Uh, Prisma seems to chase light, and so ensues some mild mid-episode peril, while Ken tries to drive Jiro to safety and forgets to turn off his headlights, so Prisma hits them with energy attacks that ram them off the road. Uh, Go turns into Ultraman and has a trippy fight with Prisma. He can't seem to damage the kaiju, and Prisma is able and by to... By trippy, you mean he falls over a lot, he, fall he falls over <laughs> a lot. Uh, he does. Uh... Uh, Prisma is also able to trap uh, Ultraman in strange, like, uh, planes of color. Um, anyway, the fight is indecisive, and when morning comes, Prisma vanishes. Uh, Matt arrives a I little I feel late. like indecisive is generous to Ultraman here. <laughs> I'm being a little generous to Ultraman. <laughs> he, get, he gets owned a little. Um, this motherfucker gets beat up by a crystal. <laughs> he does. Um, <laughs> Matt arrives a little late to do anything. What have they been up to? Well, while Go, Ken, and Jiro were doing all this, Matt picked up a survivor of one of the previous incidents, whose face yeah, was a specific, weird mess. Specifically, Ibuki was at a conference and maybe was driving them back. And by driving, I mean flying, because they're in planes. Yes. Um, they pick up a survivor from one of the previous incidents, whose face was a weird mess of rainbow-patterned crystal, and who kept shouting something about a white devil. And I'm like, oh, oh no, <laughs> run, it's the Gundam. <laughs> Uh, Wait, rainbow color damage, white devil. <laughs> this is seed coded, though. Oh no! <laughs> uh, uh. He then vanished from his hospital bed, the patient, leaving only his clothes and some glowing crystals behind. Um, Oka examined those crystals in a safe environment and found that they had become so clear as to seem invisible, except when you turn off the light, and you can see it glow. Uh, they guessed that. 
these crystals were the patient, the remnants of him. And the glow dimmed until it was gone, and the crystal had diminished to nothing. Um, now, I wish this guy got better so I could hit the button. <laughs> <laughs> no more button hitting. What, it, it's once never happening again. again. <laughs> once again. Your bit was snubbed. I'm going to mention this every time. <laughs> no, that's the new bit. Yeah, yeah that's the new bit. Uh, now, with solid evidence of a kaiju, uh, Go and Matt have to put together the two halves of their knowledge to come up with an operation that's got a fighting chance against Prisma. Uh, they reach the conclusion that Prisma previously lived in peace, frozen in the Antarctic ice until it was freed. It feeds on life. I don't like... think that's peace. That's... Listen. <laughs> <laughs> Peaceful, peaceful for them. Peaceful, peaceful for, <laughs> for for people that want to turn their lights on at night. Um, yeah. Uh, it feeds on light and so is docile during the day, uh, but goes on the hunt for light sources at night. Oka suggests that freezing it might be an effective strategy. Uh, she's still annoyed that her freezing missile strategy from a few episodes ago got turned into anesthetic again. Um, Matt stages a trap. Uh, all of Tokyo's lights are turned off, save for at a single stadium where they lure in Prisma. Uh, when Prisma appears, they drop and activate freezing bombs. Uh, this strategy is only a little bit effective and is also freezing Ueno to death. Uh, why did the, you put your guys in the stadium with the freezing bombs? Uh, I thought that, one, that was very funny to me. Two, some of those bombs, ex like... It the, they hit the ground the way, and fall over and then get and back then, up like they're clearly yeah. on strings. <laughs> yeah. So like they're, 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 good. they're very, very slow. They're falling very slowly and softly. It's so good. It's just like, I'm like, I love how you can tell they shot this a lot of times and they're like, God, fuck, this is the best one we have. This like, is, uh, this is just, we run out of time. We just have to. It's fine. Yeah. It's fine. No one cares. <laughs> um,. Uh, new idea, Go turns into Ultraman, makes himself small, and flies inside Prisma. Uh, now trapped in the crystal, Ultraman fires the space beam, and from the inside, this seems to do the trick, causing Prisma to explode. Uh, we see Go... Is this the first time Ultraman has made himself small? Yes. I think so, yes. I it's was like, we were talking about this damn. last week, I think, or the week before. S yeah. Stole it from Ultra 7. He did. Uh... We see Go alive, clawing himself out of the wreckage. The end. The episode just ends right there. And he says yeah. something like, oh, I took a real big gamble yeah, on that one. Holy yeah. shit. It's funny, it is funny how this ends. Uh, and Aki turns to uh, Oka. It's like, and history will remember us as the wives. Yep. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, I, when it comes time to vote for favorite kaiju from Return of Ultraman, do not be surprised when this is my number one. Uh, it's very I, cool. My takeaway note I have for this episode is I think Return of Ultraman would be a, possibly even above Ultra 7 for me if we had more monsters that were this fucking sick. <laughs> because holy shit. Uh... It's a neat monster. I'm not. Okay, are, I, I'm not really joking about the Ramiel thing either. It just rocks up and just sings like it's Ramiel and is just like yeah. weird and you know menacing. What? I think and yes. When I tried to look up trivia for this kaiju, I think on the wiki, Japanese wiki said, "Yeah, it's inspired Ramiel." Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, yeah. to be honest, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course it did. <laughs> not only, not uh, only is it obviously like another similarly weird crystal kaiju, but they, their method of solving it is very similar. And then they're like, "Yeah, we're gonna take all the." Turn off all the lights. Turn off all the power. Yeah. Yes. They they come up with d the plan. Capital and, T, capital P. And you 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 know something that's true about Evangelion is Ramiel is the coolest one. <laughs> yeah. I, I like the one. I like the, I like the one with Ramiel. the paper. I like the one with the paper arms a lot that gets fucking eaten. This but is, you yeah, know, Ramiel's up there. Ra Ramiel's up there. Yeah. God damn. Um. It yes, must this be is interesting a... to watch Evangelion after watching Ultraman. Yeah, I mean, it's weird that that's kind of the intended watch order. Because <laughs> like, of history. At, like, it, like, just in terms of, like, um, in terms of, like, Anno is, like, winking and nodding, right? He's, he's like, nudging the audience, like, ah, oh, remember, remember Ultraman? Ultraman was great. Um... 
The angels and, make much more sense when it's just like, yeah, he's just making weird ass Ultraman monsters. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um <clears throat> So uh the the other thing about this ep- this episode is uh so I split out in the summary, I split out the two threads into a separate thing, but we're cutting between them to the build up of the reveal of this kaiju. Um it's it's really effective. I I think the yeah. uh, the, t- the tension in this episode is uh excellent. I think the mystery is fantastic. There's kind of like an in- it's weird that it's a mystery but also there's an inevitability to like it's it's not a mystery because go is like well there's a kaiju and you and me are going to go there and we're going to see what it is. Um and it's all just You're building watching up to what it episode is. wondering, "Oh, I wonder what the weird source of the thing is and it's a kaiju." It's like, "Oh my god, it's a kaiju." <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. no, like it's neat because it starts with like there's a weird mysterious phenomenon happening, and we have a map, and it's moving towards us. It's it's very effective. Yeah, it's, it's cool. Just like we get the shot of like Go driving by himself, and we see like the flashback in the mirror, or he just yes. like has a scene of like hey, everyone be like, don't do anything rash today, Go, and he's just like, I'm gonna fucking yes, <laughs> take care of this with of- my with my with my friend the mechanic. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of mirrors in this episode. Um uh and uh Mirror, i um man. yeah i just I, I, every time that they cut to matt to reveal like another step of of how fucked up <laughs> what happened is uh to this one guy this one survivor i'm like oh damn shit's popping off yeah yeah uh i was thinking of reggie ice a lot this episode too in addition to ramiel uh, I, I love if... I love the sound of the Reggies in those anime movies. Yeah, they're so cool. Oh, oh I, I yes. have a lot of affection. I, I was I grew up on Gen three, so I have a lot of affection for these guys. Even though I don't think they're actually good, but I did pop off when like Sword and Shield added like two new ones. I was like, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> Gen three, Gen three was also my favorite growing up. Honestly, so I'm like uh, I, I also have a lot of affections for the Reggies. <laughs> yeah, it, like you had to like for Contacts Red. There was, like, weird cryptic mysteries where, like, there were these walls with, like, Braille, and he had to do, like, riddles to unlock the ability to access these guys and to fight them. I, I was... opened, I opened a, or sorry, I, I bought a Pokemon Ruby strategy guide specifically nice. so I could decode the Braille on my Game Boy Advance screen. Yeah, I, I had one myself, but, like, it was like, a, you need, like, you need a Relicanth in the first part of your party, and then, like, a Whale or a <coughs> last part of your party and you have to dig in this particular cave that you have to go through like a weird um ocean current maze to get to and then this mm-hmm. unlocks the caves on the overworld and then when you get to those vivid caves you have to do a thing uh specified in the first chamber and then you'll unlock the second chamber when you'll get to get the thing and it's it's a really cool cryptic playground talking with my friends how the fuck do you get these guys thing yeah. and it's cool and, it, and the payoff is like you get these fucking weird ass golem robot guys who are just like cryptid ass golems yeah (laughs) with these fucking Mm -hmm. weird dot eyes like it was just cool uh they they are cool i think yeah um but yeah pokemon tangents aside pokemon um, tangents aside um this episode rips yeah Um, the, the effects i like i like the idea that like Ultraman is a being of light, so of course he's not good against a kaiju that is like made of slash eats light. Right. Yes. Yeah. And I I like the there's a little bit here that absolutely caught my interest where they talk about now light is a good thing and we need it, but too much of it co- like centered into one place can make it a very destructive force because like they almost start the fire with the lens and the newspaper. Right. Yes. Um, and I'm like, oh, that's uh, that's an interesting message to put in your your uh, little hero of light show. <laughs> uh. Hmm. Um, um. The uh, the specific effects on like um, in the the first fight with Ultraman when Ultraman's getting trapped in like worlds of different color and then break like the way he breaks out and just leaves an Ultraman shaped gap in them uh, was uh, I i'm you know i'm just like yes fantastic this looks very silly brilliant uh the the effect that stood out to me was the the dude's weird rainbow skin like damage yes because um, it it looks so 
it looks cool, but like just enough, like ugh, like at the same time, they they hit a really nice balance with it. It's like a a weird glittery rainbow like burn almost. It, yeah. it's very cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I think overall this was like a like a weirdly. I mean, when I say this, I don't mean in like a way that's like it affect the like in a way that affected me, but I mean just in terms of tone, this is like a weirdly intense episode. Just because like it it, it doesn't really cut to like jokey stuff it doesn't really yeah. uh do anything like that um it's just like from the from like the first second of it it's like goes like there's a kaiju it's caught co- it's causing problems and i gotta get rid of it yeah i like the um the science stuff that ken does with jiro yeah because like it, yeah it, it, it like we know these writers fucking love science um hell yeah and it's cool just to be like as a show that's like ostensibly for kids, just having a bit of like actual science of a lesson that's like tangentially relevant to the the episode with like the cool science experiment and then just, you know the little fun bit with like, oh no, I can't find my magnifying glass. Oh no, it starts a fire. Yeah. Um, I think it's I, I Oh, go ahead. I, I I do think that like the the weird thing with the tea just feels out of place. Just in terms of like, it doesn't seem relevant, but you know, it's not a bad addition. I was, so. I was, yeah, that, I was about to that say, it was weird. <laughs> I was about to say, there's part of me that's like, oh yeah, they included a bunch of like sort of, sort of light and uh, prism facts, and then one of the, one writer was like, my kid the other day fucking poured tea directly into a <laughs> fucking glass and it shattered. Can we put in something yeah. about that? <laughs> can we, can we, can we put in of... something about that so we can teach my stupid kid? <laughs> It reminds me of once my mom was like enthusiastic because she wanted to make iced tea for us on uh, a particular day. And then she made the tea and put it in a pitcher and then put an ice in it and then the pitcher broke and, uh, and it was like, oh no. <laughs> yeah. Rip. Rip. Um, okay. I want to know who directed this episode and who wrote it. Uh, Eizo Yamagiwa was the director. I, listen, now, the listen, listen. Mr. Uh, Mr. Cultman. I'm gonna give you some credit. <laughs> I'm gonna give you some credit. You do seem more right at your job. You do seem pretty good at your job. Yeah. Um. Anyway, proceed. Uh, written by a newcomer, um, Shin Akikawa. Now, okay, you might be wondering what what's the deal with this guy. Well, I should start. Shin Akikawa is not his real name. That is a pseudonym for none other than Shin Kishida, the actor for Ken. Ken's actor wrote this episode. Oh, that's sick. Um. <laughs> Nail, yeah. While predominantly an actor, he wrote both this episode of Return of Ultraman, and I guess he also wrote the twelfth episode of Fireman, which is something he also acted in. Um, had a pretty decent acting career going on. He uh, is sometimes called the Japanese Christopher Lee because he played a vampire in the second and third entries of Michio Yamamoto's Bloodthirsty trilogy, which honestly, very funny, the next episode we have coming up, actually, yep, reading this. Yep. Um uh, he also had roles in a couple different Godzilla movies. Um, unfortunately, though, he passed away in 1982 at age 43 due to esophageal cancer. So, uh-huh. R.I.P. That's a bummer. Yeah. He seems like a cool guy. Yeah. Mm. Fireman incidentally aired like... I think it was like the year Ultraman Taro came out. Uh, it was like Super Eye's 10th anniversary. Okay. Uh, so they did. We're gonna do three shows at once this year, and uh, they did Taro, oh, no. Fireman, and Jump Out Ace all, all around the same time. No, oh. interesting. Uh, Fireman being the one that is not completely subbed yet, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Damn. Also ironic because it's the shortest one of those three. But uh, yeah. Uh, I got some, some yeah go notes. Ahead. Uh, the designer was our good friend Akiko I- Iguchi, who previously did Oxter and would go on to do Mechagodzilla. Thank you. I- listen. God, this guy fucking rules. This guy rules. <laughs> uh, I found out that he has his own principles. Hell yeah, not let's go. Of, not, li- not less yes. of them. Uh, his principles are don't worry about reality. As long as like the kaiju makes sense mechanically, because you have to like make it, uh, just Make it fun and interesting is his approach. Good. So, you know, Good. simple, but effective. He also has, like, apparently he has an approach similar to Toru Narita in terms of the design where he'll read the script first and then make the design based on what is, like, the image in his head kind of thing. 
Okay. Uh, apparently, there's the original design for this was there was a draft design by Naid Yonatani, which is more conventional uh, and less cool. And here's the design. Let's see this. Oh, this is this is nah. just fucking ice type Garamon. Nah. Yeah. Nah. It just looks, this ain't it. Just another guy. Uh, no suit actor because like a fucking <laughs> crystal shit. But yeah. Takano Batoya did do the puppet controls of it, so he's still doing stuff even if he's not in the suit. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Um. And yeah, as as with Evo episode thirty four, Sagawa was the uh, episode special effects director. I go- I googled Prisma. Um, and one of the top images is, uh, Bolton, which I'm like, yes, absolutely. Uh, this I is agree. the, this is, this is the same vibe. This is the same kind of episode. Ish. Um, man, Bolton's so cool. Was Bolton... He's a classic guy was, for a reason. Was Bolton my number one? Uh, I don't remember. I, I, I it wasn't, but, um, tr- let me check, because I have, I have our... Results saved. Um, do, do, do. Let the record show I've changed my mind. Bolton is my number one. Nice. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I had Kemmerer as my number one for Alt Q, but I think it is now. Even though I still like that Drill Snail. I'm still number uh, one on the Drill it's... Snail. <laughs> I love that Drill Snail. It is a good I thing. Don't think... uh, your, I number, don't think... your number one was Bolton. Oh, hell yeah. No, wait, oh wait, I got my confused. Yeah, Bolton versus Bolton. Yeah, Bolton. Oh, oh, Bol- oh, I see Bolton. Yes, okay. No, yeah, I want uh, Bolton the the heart. Yeah, as the heart one. thing. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. number one. Cool, I was right. With a bullet. Good. Yes, with a <laughs> yes, with a bullet. Ton. My 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 number ones have not changed. The fucking well, your number one for sea lion. Walrus. <laughs> that was not number one. <laughs> Uh, uh, fuck! What was your number one? Uh, J Malone. I'm ninety five percent sure. For yeah. Oh, I meant for, I meant for Ultra Q. Oh, for Ultra Q is kind of gone. I want to say. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It was. That makes sense. Yeah. I remember now. That makes sense. Um. Okay. Uh, do we have anything else to say about episode uh thirty five? Uh, I I just want to reiterate. I genuinely wish we had a version of the show where the kaiju were this cool this consistently oh yeah <laughs> um this this was the best one we've got so this far. is truly truly out there and uh just fantastic um and also yeah, it, just, it does good. it does cool things like the threat that it carries as well the whole like because like, you know we get this whole side a bit about this patient who is getting turned into crystals of light and reduced um and the effect of of the disappearing lighthouses and stuff i think this is like a a cool threatening kaiju um this is this is not just stepping on things which you know is is a perfectly functional thing for a a kaiju threat to be Um, i like how the stakes are higher so their plan is like it's basically the beacon episode plan but like taken mm-hmm. up a notch and also it's not ruined by like one kid talking to his friend george yes <laughs> um <laughs> they, don't, they don't make a minimi oasis fucking time no uh all right all right well on that note <clears throat> we got one more episode episode 36 uh which the title i have is kick the night away uh, I closed the book. Oh no! Um, I got banished. The ban- night. Banish the night. Okay. Well, you know, both of those work. Featuring space vampire alien Kick Dracula. Kick the night away. That song from the Barbie movie. Yep. Uh, Go and Kishida follow a woman who is emitting a strange signal, but they lose her. Uh, she arrives at an expensive house and freaks out a woman who lives there because she looks just like uh, Suzumura Midori. Uh, Midori, uh, who died six months ago. Uh, Midori uh, passes herself off as a secret younger sister, Michiko, uh, gets herself invited into the house, and then in the night, she murders this woman, drinking blood from her neck and flying away into the night, uh, as witnessed by two other members of the family. Vampires, baby. Uh, When the whole flying away thing is reported, the police pass the case over to Matt. Uh, The team investigate... 
None of those words that I said was the word that was written down. The team initiates a plainclothes investigation so as not to alarm residents with the knowledge the serial killer might be an alien. Yeah, th- this time wearing like actual civilian outfits and not just cowboy outfits. Yeah, not dressed as cowboys. Yeah. <laughs> they should have been going around Tokyo dressed as cowboys. That would have been better. <laughs> uh, you see any you see any vampires around these parts? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there's a movie called Cowboys and Aliens, which is just, we are dressing up as cowboys in an ultra show. That's what that's what that is. Um, Juro puts up loads of garlic and crucifixes around the house as wards, and he insists the killer might be an alien because six months ago a UFO was seen over a villa. Uh, Matt needs to investigate this, and the task falls to Go, Kishida, and Oka. Uh, Oka volunteers on the basis that the vampire only attacks young women, and depending on the circumstances, she could serve as bait. Oka, you gotta... <laughs> uh, yeah, the... I was like, you gotta respect yourself a little bit more. This is, uh, this is sad. Uh, She's like, I need to find a way to keep myself relevant, even though I guess I did okay in the You could use me as episode. bait if you want. <laughs> Tragic. Uh, these three visit the father of uh, Suzumura Midori, and he soon admits to having preserved her body and buried her instead of cremating her. Uh, they visit the grave with the father, and Oka stays behind at the cave entrance to keep watch. Uh, flags. Uh, inside, they find the big gothic coffin. It's big stone coffin. Uh, the father removes the lid, and Midori is missing. Oka screams. She has been attacked. Uh, Go and Kishida chase Midori and follow her in the Matt Arrow to a spaceship. The rest of Matt arrives after night has fallen and they hold off the attack until morning. Go receives telepathic messages saying he's a traitor for siding with humans instead of aliens. Uh, The the telepathic message also sent something along the lines of, all we want to do is destroy humanity. (laughs) Um... Go reject. And the way you do that is by targeting the women. Yeah, yeah. You tar- <laughs> target specify. young and women you took- because that's how you make new people. Yeah, you target young women one by one. Yeah, one at a time. What? <laughs> on a nightly <laughs> yeah. basis. You worst like attempt a, ever. He's like, how many can there be? <laughs> uh, um, I've, you know... Um, <laughs> Draculus is like I've watched. I've watched Return of Ultraman. How many women can there be in the world? <laughs> um, this also reveals that Go's one true weakness is if you telepathically, telepathically yes. communicate with him, he will argue with you. <laughs> he will lose his Dan, If Dan, Dan gets a telepathic message about "Ooh, we 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 want to destroy. We want to. We're going to kill individual women on a nightly basis," and Dan will just silently just kind of brood a little bit and then enact like a plan that will destroy you <laughs> um and goes like shut up and then everyone else around him is like go what are you talking and about? he's like who, oh, who are you talking to oh, no one <laughs> i'm normal go's mind is normal <laughs> um the spaceship takes off and the team have no choice they have to attack the monster um, which that, that's their job. Uh, so ensues a huge dogfight with the spaceship, and when they shoot it down, it turns into the giant kaiju Draculus. Uh, the team engages Draculus, uh, but Midori's father is present. Why? Uh, and he sees uh, Midori in place of Draculus. Uh, giant woman return. Giant. Giant woman does woman return. Has returned. Return. <laughs> return of the giant woman. Well, yes. Um, I think this is like. There's like, there's one Ultra in. Seven is the only show that hasn't had this. Ultra Q didn't have a giant woman. It had giant men. Yeah, we yeah, but it was an old pioneer. We counted in. Okay, like that's fair. Of the thing. Um. So, uh, yeah, we got giant, giant Midori, uh, and then Go, uh, stops. Where, where am I? Where's my? Where am I? I've written this down somewhere. Yeah, there we go. Go. Okay, Go does not top him. Go stops him. There we. Go. Let's correct that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Freudian slip. Sorry, sorry. Oh listen. Uh, Go stops him from doing anything stupid and then turns into Ultraman. Um, uh, they fight and Dracula bites Ultraman's neck, draining his energy. 
uh, Ultraman gets free and then hits Draculas with the false sun stake through the heart combo. Um, throws the spear through through the heart. Draculas disappears, leaving only Ash and the body of Midori behind. Uh, Go returns Midori's body to her father, who apologizes to his daughter for caring so much about how beautiful she is that he refused to cremate her. Um, with the vampire gone, Jiro doesn't need all that garlic anymore, so he eats literally all of it and starts breathing the worst garlic breath in the world directly in the face of Ken and Go. Uh, the end. Uh, not Lowe's happening in this episode. Yeah. I, do, uh, I am realizing how much they're finding more ways to just integrate Ken and Jiro into every episode while not having Aki at all. Yeah, she's just not there. I do wonder if so, there's like a if there's like a production side reason for that. Well, uh, which yeah. I will try now, and discover. Before before we get into the uh, conversation for the thing, I'm I'm not going to say what was in what I saw in the next time for the next Me week's first episode. <laughs> uh, but I saw it. Uh, <laughs> did, did did you see it, Mel? I saw it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, I look forward to uh, to next week's episodes. Um, yeah. But um, the auto masterpieces continue. <laughs> The, yes, the awesome masterpieces continue. I think it's uh, December now. I looked at the dates of the episodes, but you know, whatever. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, this episode is kind of, it's, you know, it's not really much of a vampire episode. Yeah. Also, Brad, really, so that's, that's, yeah, so what. Well, I, well, I'm going to I'm going to go in reverse reverse order of what I wanted to talk about now because you brought that up specifically. Okay. Um, I, I might as well say this. This is directed by the Masanori Kake, who we've had do a few other ones. He's the mm-hmm. C guy who did the comedy series and then written by Toshi Toshi. Uh, God, I can't speak. Toshiro Ishido, who also did the Oxter episode, and this is the second episode he's written now where I feel like the science explanation stuff kind of gets in the way of my enjoyment of the episode. I think this would be so much cooler if this was just a fucking vampire story mm-hmm. and they don't know what exactly is going on. The fact that we need the the scientific explanation or like it has to be an alien every single time, I feel like sometimes limits, specifically Return of Ultraman, and just leaning into the horror a little bit. Um, and I, I wish we had that space for more unexplainable things and, and weird phenomenon. Um, Mm -hmm. and I, like, there's, like, a a secular take on everything that I find somewhat limiting sometimes. Uh, Uh, it's a, it's a, uh, how we know this is a good Christian show. (laughs) True, true. (laughs) Um, there is, there is a, there is a line in this, I just want to draw attention to, uh, a line in this episode where the Go, Kishida, and, uh, uh, and Oka are in the Matt Arrow heading out to the cave or whatever, and they're talking to each other about how, damn, and vampires aren't common in Japan, so the alien knew where to, you know, our weakness knew <laughs> is that well, like, we don't have many vampires in Japan. And I was like, do they have, do they have vampires elsewhere? <laughs> I like, uh, I like, the- I like the part early on where, like, um, hold on, let me find my notes. Um, Go and Kishida uh, hear about the vampire cases, and they're like, "Ah, damn! I wonder if that's anything to do with the girl we were following." Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, Oka uh, channeling Giren goes, "Oh, you mean vampires for the Middle Ages?" <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And then, and then, like uh, everyone in the room starts laughing about how, like, how it's funny the vampires are eating the rich, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um. Like it. It. It was so weird to me. They. They keep bringing up like, "Oh yeah, like." Well, according to, like, vampire lore and stuff like that, and this alien just happens to follow all of the rules of, like, vampires, like, from folktales and legends. And I'm like, how much cooler would this be if they're fighting something and they go, oh, God, this works just like a vampire. Is this a vampire? Are vampires real? <laughs> um, I just think it would be such so much stronger for it. Um, but no, it's just uh, it's just an alien who happens to work exactly like vampires do. Um, Probably better the- that this, uh, that we at least got a more conventional vampire as opposed to ultra sevens vampire who is, <laughs> who is, uh, you know, offensive. I, I think 
also too um thank you Minami. i can't i can't explain this but i th something about her flying around in that like white dress and the arrow chasing after her like really stuck in my brain as like oh this is cool like yeah, it was, it's, really it's weird and creepy and, and fun weird. yeah it's good yeah in, in a way that the, like, the, like the dog fight with a spaceship isn't <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that sure does just feel like really goofy. Like, oh, they're taking off. We gotta take off. Oh, we shot down. We gotta land now. Yeah, um, it's it's also just kind of it's very. It goes on for a bit. They spend a lot of money on this, and I'm gonna be honest. I was looking at my phone. I was, I was not. I was. I was like, <laughs> okay, well, it's a you know, it's a, it's a spaceship. Sometimes there out. is just the part of the episode where I'm like, I'm not gonna pay attention as much or write as many notes because this is just for the battle rages. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yes, it's, this feels like a, this episode feels like a wasted opportunity because, you know, we could have got like a, a fun, like, like kind of gothic horror episode. Um, we could have done it. Um, no, but instead of following up the initial murder victim with a potential next murder victim, we just go straight to, oh, we found the coffin. Um, and it's. I it just it's just it's just so it's so weird that halfway through the episode and like oh there's the spaceship and now we're gonna wait um I just you know strange they said they're like hey we can attack it now and then because like, no we have to attack in the morning uh that that is another Ibuki being wise to be honest he's like this <laughs> this this alien seems to be following vampire rules so you know what. Let's follow vampire rules. We'll kill them in the morning. Um, uh, the, it's um, funny, the cops are like, listen, we were going to take this as a homicide, but then he started flying, and now we got to call you guys. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That is pretty good. I did like that. Where they're like, yeah, as soon as we saw, we got reports that uh, the suspect was flying, we're like, ah, fuck, we, we should talk to Matt about this. Yeah. <laughs> not, not stated, but like last week, um, in like the weird snail ice episode mm -hmm. with the farting snail monster, um, a bunch of people do just call Matt the monster cops. They do. <laughs> they do. And it's do like, that. oh, you, you, I forgot about that. You just they, they just they just say it. <laughs> They're the cops. I'm glad this is the text of the show. Yeah. Um, you you shout it out briefly. I've just posted a couple of images. The, yeah, the amazing bit at the beginning where. Uh, the crew of Matt are gathered around talking about well why does why does the vampire only seem to kill like rich people that is that is it really a vampire or is it just a serial killer and Minami's like well the rich are healthy after all their blood must taste good and they're all go <laughs> and like when is like oh not like us <laughs> 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 like, hell yeah hell yeah dude yeah, that's good it's a good moment yeah um, I am. I'm. Do we have any opinions about this kaiju? Let me look up Draculus. I need to have. I, I don't it like it. It's just a boring. No, bat. not Dra not Dracula's plural. Dracula's Ultraman. Um, <laughs> I think like as far as like weird bat kaiju go, Icarus is better. Oh yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I that, my I I feel like this is the weakest one in this batch. I like this episode more, I think, than the the first episode we watched. But I think the kaiju is very boring. <laughs> I think I think I go the other way. I think I like the first episode more than this. Yeah, I think that's where I go to. I go but, 35, uh, 34, 36. But um but yeah, it's kind of similar ish in terms of like um I just think there's there's you know, there's kind there's kind of nothing here. It's kind of just set up for a fight, and then they fight, and then it's nothing special happens, really. It's it's basically like the most Road Ultraman episode you can think of. Yeah. Derog yeah, derogatory. I, I, yeah. When the actress... When, uh, is her name Midori? Again, yes. Midori. When she gets to fly around and be weird, I liked that a lot. Mm -hmm. But the actual monster stuff, I do think, is kind of whatever. Mm-hmm. 
I think, yeah, I think I put this above the first just mostly because, like, the Mizuno stuff, I was just kind of like, oh, you're okay. You're just some dude. I don't care about you. <laughs> yeah. But. Yeah. I did like um, the very beginning of the episode, uh, the way that she uh, sneaks her way into this house to kill this woman. I was like, I want more. I want the rest of the episode to be her attempting to kill someone else. Uh, and yeah, yeah I, I, I like, I like the very, like, deliberate pointing attention to, oh, but she got invited in. Yeah, there's, it's like the, um, it's the, oh, I, you're Midori's younger sister? I thought she was an only child. So, well, yeah, I was put up for adoption when I was born, um, and uh, Midori was never told about me, and then when she died, I was invited back to the family. And uh, this woman, instead of going, that's incredibly sus- weird, uh, is like, <laughs> yeah. is like, oh, yeah, you do look like her. Well, no shit. <laughs> <laughs> uh yeah, you should come to my place so we can look at photos and then sleep in the same bed together. Yeah. Also, yeah, my husband and son over. who have never been in this uh, interaction found my body. I can't. I can't get a. I can't get a read on how old she is. I don't know if she's supposed to be like an adult woman who is married to one of those men that came in, or if she's supposed to be like younger. I can't. I can't. I don't know. Like the the old man is her dad. Do you think? Maybe. I that I kind of thought that I um, because like Midori was stated like she was twenty when she died, right? So she's probably like mm-hmm. yeah early twenties ish. Hmm. Uh, there was yeah. just some something about the vibe of um this sleepover that was just like are these are you be playing children? What's happening here? <laughs> you look so much older than you're acting. I- <laughs> Um, but, uh, yeah. I, can I say, I sometimes have that with Jiro, especially in this batch of episodes. Oh, okay. I feel like sometimes they have Jiro act a little bit younger than his actor looks. I see. How, okay. I, let, don't, I let, don't know. Let me look up, uh, it, let, let's hope it's safe to look up Jiro Return of Ultraman. No, wait, no, wait, I'll, I'll do it, I'll do it. Okay, you do it, go ahead. Because sometimes I feel like they have him on the script or, like, on the page, like, acting as if he's a few years younger than Mm -hmm. where I think his actor is actually at. I don't know. I've just noticed that a few times where I'm like, kid, you're, I feel like you're a little too old to be specifically, like, doing this sort of thing or or saying this sort of thing. I don't know. So, Jiro's character, Jiro the character is 11. Uh, but his actor was born in 61, so he would have been, like, 10 at the time of filming. Oh, okay. Oh. This is... is Jiro's, Jiro's actor is 10 years old? Yeah. I would have... He's... Huh. He's, he's, he's... Yeah. He's got, got a... He's got a... good actor. Also, it's <laughs> funny that, like, the second result was Jiro Dan plays <laughs> of Texas. Yes. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I had just assumed he was, like... Uh, a teenager who looked young enough. Um, that's kind of I. I did not expect him to be ten. I thought he was a little bit older. Yeah. That's uh, uh, that's impressive. Uh, I'm just reminded now suddenly, and like for whatever reason, in the live action drama of um, Higarashi, uh, mm-hmm. the person they got to play Keiichi, the protagonist, uh, was the same guy who the previous year played uh, Kamen Rider Mach in Kamen Rider Drive. I see. Uh, and that character in that show. In in Kamen Rider Drive, is like eighteen or nineteen, mm-hmm. uh, and Keishi is a fourteen year old child. <laughs> nice, <laughs> damn. I know uh, the actor is more suited to one of those roles age wise than the other. Nice. I, I gotta I gotta say now, like uh, Jiro, in terms of like just talking about like uh, Jiro performance. Um, something I didn't mention about the first episode from this week uh, was uh, the moment he, that he like um, tells Go about. How, like how scared he is and how he needs help uh i was like you know it was pretty convincing i, I yeah. thought they yeah. did a very good job on that yeah it was good no jiro is a like good actor that kid um shame on right. misogyny but <laughs> you know this was a fairly f- so, wait uh, i was the, watching is the, is the I misogyny watching... ad lib it's the actor <laughs> <laughs> It's the, it's actually it's actually the the actor that's uh, Jiro's actor is the misogynist uh, and he's adding it he refuses to not do it on camera. 
So the thing is, I went into the sub like like I said with friends or whatever. Um, I was like, oh, get a load of this kid. He always says says weird misogynist shit that everyone else in the show disagrees and with. Then he's just normal. And then my friend Ray was very. <laughs> My friend Ray was very disappointed that this child did not deliver any massage. Yeah, you need, you need to just show her the first five minutes of the Oxter episode. <laughs> it's because he, it's cause I, he I did killed Aki off group screen. Chat. <laughs> he he uh. just, you know, he's, he's, I don't, I don't know what happened to Aki, but Jiro is involved. Yeah. Um, all right. Well. Jiro gave her to the to the vampire. Yeah, yeah. I got my my trivia. <laughs> okay, go for it. Hit us. Um, another kaiju design by Gucci. Um, nice. Um, probably his weakest so far. Um, mm-hmm. also played by Toya again. Apparently, the actress for uh, Midori is Yukio Tobe. Uh, and just because you know. Round and out. I'm gonna give some trivia of Ichi Kikuchi, who is the guy in the Ultraman suit. Okay. Uh, so previously discussed in the past, he he's sort of like first role. I think as a suit actor, I guess in the Ultra series was uh, Ultra Seven for the King Joe two part specifically. Um, because you know most of the show is a different guy. Uh. He originally, when approached to do the role of Ultraman in this show, he turned it down and recommended another guy. Uh, his reason being that uh, I I played Ultraman Ultra Seven for those two episodes and it was hard. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, eventually, he was called again uh, because Jiro Dan got the role uh, of you know Go, and they thought that uh, then the guy he he recommended didn't have the same physique as Jiro Dan. No one had the same physique. That man is so tall. <laughs> and I also, I don't know how it's relevant. Like, Ultraman is a different guy than Go. Uh, so. Now, now something that is funny, I guess, thinking about it, is that Ultraman looks less tall than than Go does. Like, like Ultraman is bigger. Ultraman, is, like, in the show is bigger but next to but like, monsters, he looks less like just as a person, he looks less tall yeah. than Jiro Dan, who is very tall. Um, yeah. I guess is my he had one two contribution. <laughs> he had two conditions. One was uh, pay me uh, one and a half times as much as the other guy. Uh, wow! And two, let me play. <laughs> what a what, what a yeah! What a demand! <laughs> oh, yeah. well, let me play. Let me play a minor role as Matt as a Matt guy a little bit. Uh, and for, for somehow <laughs> the Super Riot guys were very happy to pay him that much money. Uh, but they were like, uh, to be honest, we got all the Matt roles kind of filled, so we can't. We we'll, we'll squeeze you in the guest role somewhere. Uh, and then he was then pretty satisfied with that because he was like, well, you know what, playing Ultraman is pretty hard as it is so it's fine have we seen his guest role yet i don't know if we have okay um he ended up apparently i think at the start he didn't really like the job but he grew to like more fun over time especially started getting more fan mail of like the kids who are like oh ultraman you're my hero i like nice. to on tv because you're cool oh that's nice uh so that's nice uh also there's apparently in the second episode uh he was waiting in the special effects cool and then electricity ended the pool and he almost got electrocuted uh, damn so yeah. uh, so you know that's fun not fun actually uh he also did shoot down uh the returning of her ultraman ace so it's a different guy in the suit next time okay uh okay. it sounds like being ultraman is a hard job yeah it sounds like it i mean you're you're wrestling i'm, I'm sure i'm sure uh <laughs> bin for was pretty happy to just be a maki instead of ultras <laughs> yeah he just sit in jaws <laughs> yeah, it's nice. He really hammed it up in that last episode, though. It's pretty. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's great. You got to have fun. Uh, I'm all, I'm always thinking about the last episode of Ultra Seven. It's a good time. Um, was there more trivia, or was that the that, the, no, was that no, the trivia? My, that's trivia for this episode. I always have some more, I have some more backfilling trivia, but that comes uh, later. Okay, after um, our next segment. 
so, do we have anything more to say about episode 36? That's a no. Not particularly. That's a no. It was near. Yeah. Was near. Call of the Night does vampires better. Yeah. I haven't watched that show, but uh, I'm just going to say I'm just going to say yes. Um, I, know, I like it. I should read the manga, but I'm bad at reading manga. Uh, God, I am also bad. I'm. I have been trying to read my fucking uh mid rom com for fucking ages and every time i sit down at my desk thinking like well i'm gonna i'm gonna load it up and read it right now and i don't um i think i've been reading oshinoko and chainsaw man but i've not really read any more of that since we've started this podcast damn somehow i keep up with jojo lands but that's it that's the only thing i keep up with oh yeah i forgot i started reading that either <laughs> Uh, it's okay. I need to read part seven and on anyways first. So, mm-hmm. all right. Well, uh, those are the episodes this week. Uh, color timers. Hello. Uh, episode 34, one minute, oh. 52 seconds. Okay. Now episode 35, I bet episode 35 is rough. Yeah. There's two of them. Um, first one, three minutes, 13 seconds. Yeah. So that come. Uh, up. however, second one, one minute, 11 seconds. Okay. Okay, pulled it back. Uh, episode 36, 3 minutes, 31 seconds. Damn, it lacks. Waste, waste, going over, going over time for that fight. Uh, th- now, he, now, here's the thing, here's the thing. The 3 minute timer, I think, instead of it being like a, a, like a, like a threat to like, the character, I think the 3 minute time, I think if you're implementing the 3 minute timer, you should also be implementing that on a level of like, writing, and directing. Like, as like a limit on yourselves, to put space in the rest of the episode for stuff. I mean, that was kind of the point, right? It was like the money timer, like Kanagon. Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I sometimes forget that Kanagon, you had to, you had to literally put money money in Kanagon to make him live. Um, New gotcha game idea. Hell yeah! <laughs> oh, you want to roll for cute anime girls? Well, you better keep paying. <laughs> you um, Do you want Kanagon to die? <laughs> you see this timer? And just let him fucking die. Um. <laughs> all right. Uh. Was it? Yeah. Is there another bit I'm forgetting, or are you are you gonna hit us with more trivia? I got the trivia, and then I got the emails. Okay, go. No capsule monsters this week. <laughs> <laughs> what if he just suddenly <laughs> threw out a capsule monster one episode? Uh Ultraman should have done that. Ultraman, the super weapon. Ultra Seven su- comes the- back at some point in this show and throws like Agira out. <laughs> yeah, the weapon that Ultra Seven should have given to uh ultraman was a capsule monster should have done that oh, that would have been sick and then they would have proceeded to not use them and would be like oh yeah that's right <laughs> yeah um yeah. all right anyway the first kaiju we got one of our favorites highlight of the show gorgos yep that's the one <laughs> that's what yeah. Uh, designer Taru Naruto. Uh, reviewing the bio of Taru Naruto, I realized probably most of the stuff there is to talk about him has already been talked about in this podcast. Sorry. Okay. All right. That's uh, fair. However, some other some 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 notes I did find is uh one, he's also involved with like mechanical design as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and two, this is more unfortunate. Uh. And later in life, um, he began having like issues with like copy, basically having copyright legal issues with Superaya on the basis of like mm-hmm. he made Mickey Mouse uh, and all the other famous kaiju, uh, and he was like, "Well, I should get royalties." I think right. yes, uh, and so. Yeah. Rightfully so, and so many disagreements with like Superaya over like, yeah, I bet ownership and like any efforts to like bring him back on board for like future stuff. Like apparently the one gold and black uh, design of Ultraman that like he did that uh, Shin Ultraman Zoffy is based off of mm-hmm. uh, 
was going to be for like a 90s show ultraman great uh but like he ultimately never joined because he the, the issue of royalties was just one that like uh never got resolved uh that sucks. and apparently like all all his like art stuff and like ideas and stuff are currently like after he died uh they're owned by his wife copyright wise and uh no, nothing went over to super uh so you know mm-hmm. uh, a bit of bad blood there uh corporations are not your friend no they're not no nope. also did you know gorgos was a british thoroughbred racehorse and sire <laughs> i just found out by googling yeah famous racehorse. uh we got go. more info on mm-hmm. the sculptor ryo sako takeyama who is Turin Art has collaborator for a lot of designs as like the sculptor. He's okay. considered the father of kaiju for his role in sculpting Naruto has many creations. That uh, seems like an important guy oh. to note to take note of. Yeah, so I have a bit more of a broad coverage of his career. Uh, he apparently joined Toho during the war in 1943, so you know it was involved in like the propaganda stuff. Uh, and he left in 1951. Uh, and we go on to work out uh, for a Dae, uh, who is responsible for the Gamera movies and uh, Daimajin. I don't know if you guys know that movie series. Nope. nope. Uh, Diamond Jean's like basically another kaiju movie, but instead it's like set in feudal Japan and it's like a giant Oni oh. kind of monster or samurai okay, that's armor cool. guy terrorizing. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, he worked. He was working for Dae, uh, but then was eventually scouted by Superaya, and we go on to work on a lot of stuff for Ultra Cute and Man, um, and then eventually Seven as well. Uh. He was still doing work for Dae, so he did like work for the Daimajin movies in particular, and also did uh, at least one Gamera movie he did effects on in Sculpting Fall. Sick. And he continued, he he stayed at Tsuburaya even after Naruto left. Uh, and so he worked on the like, KS designs for Seven, and he also worked on like, the Mighty Jack series. Mm-hmm. Uh, Return of Ultraman would be his last contribution to uh, the Ultra series, but he's still working on like, a few Tsuburaya stuff in the future, like Silver Mask and Iron Man, and, and Fireman. Uh, he also did some work on like Sector Man and stuff, uh, and sadly he would die of cancer in 1982. Rip. R.I.P. Also, as a weird note, uh, because of there was a there was like a labor dispute at Toho at the time, uh, he became a member of the Communist Party from 1946 to 1950. <laughs> no. Hell yeah. Uh, the suit actor for Gorgos is Haryoshi Nakamura, and the special effects director for I think it was episode seven of Mount Fuji SOS was Toro Matoba. Uh, he is another guy from Dae. Uh, and he saw himself as A.G. Tsuburaya's rival. Uh, and so when he was brought on to work with Ultra Q, he was a bit more competitive with what he was doing. Um, now, now, now. Did A.G. Tsuburaya ever mention this? Because <laughs> if not, so. that's, a, that's very funny. But also, but also, I haven't done a deep dive on like A.G. Tsuburaya's biography, to be honest. That's, that's, that's um, true, that's true. Anyway. Like I, I found more info about Seiji Tsuburaya from this guy. Uh, like the fact that... I, got, I guess I'll just say it now. Uh, Eiji was, you know, he was at Toho uh, during the war. Uh, and then in 1948, he was purged from Toho at the insistence of the American occupation. Uh, because they saw his models in those war movies and thought he was a spy because they thought <laughs> the info was too... <laughs> the models were too good. Uh, what? Oh, that's hilarious. Yeah, oh, like that. oh, right. Oh, like the military. Okay, the military stuff. Okay, that's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, and then during his sort of like interregnum uh, before going back to Toho, t- t- from Toho, Toho, uh, Super I did, uh, did some uh, more freelance work with uh, a contract work with Dae. Uh, and he considered being like, getting, becoming an employee there, and then he didn't like how the projects were handled, so he didn't, and he went back to Toho. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, back to Matoba. Um, he often found, like, T and AG had created differences, so they butt head lots, but he did find that ultimately their discussions were, like, productive in the end, uh, and a product, had a positive result on the end product. Uh, he had an inter- interesting anecdote where he compared the effects of, like, AG Subraya and thus, like, the Toho style, uh, to the Dai Dai House style. Mm-hmm. In his words, um, the Dai style was aiming for realism that helped immerse the audience in the story. He felt that AG would often, like, for example, giving example of building a locomotive, he, the, he AG would build something elaborate that's kind of a work of art in its own right. Meanwhile, Dai A style would be more like building something that fits in with the rest of the scene. 
he felt like the dice effects were cheaper as a result, but he felt like confident in their skills that the audience would not be able to tell from a glance that there's a special effects. Um, mm-hmm. So that's interesting. Uh, apparently he also liked puppet kaiju more than he liked suits. Uh, and one example of this was he was uh, one of the guys involved with the Boston episode. So I'm going to be honest. I think I might be team puppet. I think it depends. Really? I like a guy in a suit, but when they manage to pull off the puppet. Yeah, a good puppet is pretty good because you don't need to be yeah. sucked to the fucking bipedal dinosaur design. Yeah, I think that might part be part of it for me. Oh. And sometimes, too, you get a puppet as just a dumb little guy. And if I know there's you like learned, Alien Cool. <laughs> I like me a dumb little guy. I know you like guy. Alien Cool. It's in the name. Listen, it's Alien, Alien Cool. Is cool. <laughs> But Alien Pole. Alien oh, Alien, Alien Pole is barely a design. It's a little, like, sheet of paper on, uh, around, like, like a little wire frame, um, and it just go, you know, it just, like, you just, like, move it up and down so that it looks like it's, like, kind of floating, um, and then you put on a weird squeaky voice, and there you go, you got Alien Pole. Yeah, and you have my number one ranked kaiju for, yeah. uh... You, you also have to say extremely, uh, evil, like, mean things. You can't say anything yeah. nice. It's not Alien Pole at that point. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, do, I, think, I, I think I like... I like the suit kaiju a lot, but I also think a good puppet is a good puppet. Like the mm-hmm. fucking crystal this week. Yes. You know, now that he has the bracelet and he can do some Ultra 7 cutting, I need to see a dumb little puppet guy get bisected before the show is uh-huh. over. I need this. Yes, yeah. we'll see. Uh, next up, we got Monkula, the mole. Mm-hmm. Uh, suit act- oh, the volcanic layer strikes yes, again. Yes. Oh, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. Uh, yeah, never mind. Yeah, so Toro Matoba, his first episode directing, set, a special effects director of Ultra Q was uh, episode 7 of Uji SOS. Um, yeah, Mongola, uh, suit actor is Yukio Fukudome. Uh, the special effects director for that episode was Kawakami Keiji. Uh, who also did special effects for episode 4, episode 5, and episode 8. So this one. Uh, for whatever reason, there's like no info on who designed this guy. Uh, okay. So rip. Uh, and then finally, our, our goat, the tarantula, Baron Spider. Hell yeah! Baron Spider rules. Uh, designer, Yasuki Inoue. Previously did uh, Gomez. God, you know uh, what, you're right, puppets are so fucking cool. So. <laughs> I did. <laughs> he did another Baltic stuff. I think he did Litra as well, but yeah. Uh, Gomez, those ones. It just said the sculptor was on the special effects team, so cool. Thanks. Great. Uh, and special effects director was Hajime Koizumi, who did episode one, episode six, and then this one, episode nine. And yeah, that's that's all I got for this week. Gonna, nice. gonna you know, picking and choosing my trivia selectively. Mm hmm. Remember, remember when Jun uh, just just lies down and has a nap in the middle of a haunted house? <laughs> That's my goat. That's my goat. What a king. Uh-uh. Yeah. Uh, All right. That episode looks so good. It does. In black and white. In black and white. In Kurosawa mode. In Kurosawa mode. <laughs> uh, All right. Emails. Emails. So first one is from Cross Zeta. Oh, hello again. Hello again. Uh, hello, Ultra Q Pod. In the Ultra 7 email section, I did write about how, as a kid, when watching a serialized show, you do not really need, you do not really get to watch a show in order. This is also the case when, as a kid, all at my relative's house, they got me a DVD since I liked a different Ultraman show as a kid. My first experience of Return of Ultraman is the finale of the Austin awesome Master series, uh, the two-parter we get next week. That's funny. So, uh... So... Let's watch again. Let's watch again next week, shall we? Is what they say. Yeah. Uh, that's so, uh, yeah. yeah. What? What? Watching TV before you could just uh, cheat. Um, yeah, was, was different. I I think I've brought this up before, but when I was like a kid, and I'm talking like really little kid, I printed out. This is obviously kind of adorable. I had printed out a list of Dragon Ball Z episodes, and I tracked what episodes of Dragon Ball Z I had seen. That's so cool. Um, (laughs) Nice. And like that, like that, kids just don't wouldn't do that now. I mean, you 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 just watch it. You just watch it. (laughs) 
but it felt like a scavenger hunt at the time, you yeah. know? Like, <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know if I had anything like that as a kid. Um, I don't know which shows I was keeping track of to like a ridiculous degree. Hot Probably helps that I only sporadically had cables, so you know. You're too busy learning about dinosaurs. Uh, that is true. Also, Bionicle. Yes. Um. All right. Thank you, Cross. I'm oh, sorry, Bionicle. That's the correct. Yeah, B Bionicle. <laughs> <laughs> they come in cups. Yeah. They come in go cups. Up, go, go, go! Listen to skipping the queue. Because <laughs> apparently that's where that discussion is locked to. It is. It was very imp- important to the episode. I can't remember why. It's very important to the episode that we talked about the red one with the fire sword. It doesn't narrow it down. <laughs> the red ones all have fire swords. Uh, not true. The one guy had like a disc launcher. Oh, this is true. This is true. This is true. You are absolutely correct. Um, all right. Uh, thank you, Cross Data. Uh, do we have any more emails? Thank you. Yep, we got such an email. Hello. Uh, so what a wacky load of coincidences set around episode 34's one-off contributor. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's saying he hopes that we've got all the info about him from Brad, which I think we did. Uh, but if yeah. not, then he'll give us more details next week. All uh, right. Fill in the gaps. Yeah, if I missed anything, fill in the gap, because I just, I mean, most of what this dude was involved with, it seemed like, was focused on his acting career. So, like, mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. I I just kind of focused in on that. It didn't seem like there was too much, but if I miss stuff, definitely feel free to fill in. Uh, yeah. Uh, anyway, more more people building up next week. Um, okay. Uh, next week appears to be a very big week for the show. I see. Um, I'm I, uh, maybe... I I I could kind of tell from the next time on. I'm gonna be honest. Yeah. I... Uh. <laughs> Probably That's too late. How, this <laughs> but, is how but, this uh, is how the seventies be. <laughs> so Jixer says, yeah. uh, "Do not do not spoil yourself on the next three episodes." Uh, uh, I think I already know what happens because I got spoiled looking up production notes weeks ago. So. This is well, uh, I guess all the more reason I might, I might end up just watching those episodes later today, just because I'm like, well, I do need to see the episodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, if the, the, I am in a I generally think that if the next time on tells me something about next episode, I consider it less a spoiler and more just, oh, hell yeah, the 70s. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm still in my, my lifelong stance of spoiler. I, I was about to say spoilers aren't real. That was stupid. Uh, <laughs> that spoilers do not, do not phase my enjoyment of things as much as I think they do yeah. for most mm-hmm. people. However, I do like still keeping in the dark about things as much as possible. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I mean, I'm not going to go out of my way to find shit, but if I get spoiled on things, I don't. Eh. I enjoy things more or less the same if I if it's a surprise or not, I feel. That's just how I noodle media in my brain at this point. So. All right. Like when two ho hosts get collected. I've been, using, been using the word noodle in a lot lately. I don't know how to feel about that. Yeah. Do you just want noodles? I do. Let's go get ramen. I actually could get ramen. I was about to say ramen sounds really fucking good right now, actually. I'm gonna go get ramen uh, after this. I can do that. Yeah, I, I think I might go get ramen after this too. Let's go. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. Also, they send a they send a, one of their new up, YouTube uploads because you know such a channel has like a. It's also alternate music stuff. Um, okay. So there's cool. like yeah, he sent like a a video that's basically like a playlist of translated songs from Blazer. Okay, that's cool. Uh, because you're like, oh yeah, this blazer's still relevant light. And I'm like, yes, it's going to be relevant until the movie is finally <laughs> covered by the podcast. Uh, still, still no sign. Uh, oh well. <laughs> yeah. We've got, we've, we've got, we've got, got our, we've got our coverage for Mirror Man. Um, yeah. It's set in stone already. So we, you know, it, it's basically just a case of when the blazer movie, uh, becomes available for us to watch it uh with english subs we'll be able to yeah yeah i saw the first episode what if they just Man, never yeah. subbed it uh someone's gonna sub it rip yeah someone will yeah it would be very funny and also horrible if like if you didn't get subs until after arc started that would be yes um no it'd just be like the weird train episode of watching you <laughs> 
God. You get the final part just way fucking later. I can't believe they did that. I I <laughs> so, can't believe I, they I wish did I could, that. I wish I could go back in time and say the correct date because I completely missed the mark on just how late they pushed that episode. Yeah. God. Absolutely bizarre. Anyway. Uh, we were like, oh man, this episode aired the same week as the Jamal episode. That's weak. And then we find out, no, it was the same episode as Alien Spell. <laughs> Uh, um, all right. All right. Yeah, I saw. I... Do we have. Oh, did, have I skipped uh, the end of Cydrix's email? No, no. I was, just, I was gonna say, oh, yeah, I saw what episode one of Mirror Man already this week. Oh. Uh, yeah, I that's need to. weird. I, I need to start. <laughs> I also need to start. I should. I should. How, how much longer we got? We got two weeks. Yeah. Two weeks. So I could break that up into six and six. Oh, wait, no, we're watching 13 at the start. Yeah. No, we're watching 12. Oh, we are 12 at the start? Yeah, okay. 12 at the start. Every The other one's going to be 13. That's right. That's right. Okay, I'll do six and six. Done. Make it easy on my life. All right. All right. I think that's an episode of the podcast. Yeah, um, we did it if at a normal, reasonable length. Normal, reasonable yeah, I need, length. I need ramen. We talked about Ultraman... Uh, we talked about everything else. We did it. Congratulations. Um, if you want to follow the show on Twitter, you can do so at ultra underscore Q. That is at ultra underscore Q U E U E. Uh, I am also on Twitter at gender underscore redacted. If you want to follow me, uh, Mel. Uh, you can follow me at the crowns on blue sky, blue sky and Twitter. Uh, we have the email at gmail.com. You guys can email us uh, for next week. It seems like it's going to be important. Uh, but if not, you know, get your questions ready for the finale. I think we got like a month left of the show after next week. So, you know. God, that's wild. Coming, coming in hot. Coming Ultraman Ace in like a month. Yeah. The asexual Ultraman. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and we have the coffee all too fun. You know this feel by now. And if you don't, uh, why are you listening to uh, This Is Your First Episode? True. Uh, Brad. Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter at B underscore invoked and my extremely dead blue sky I should probably get back to. Uh, that's B invoked. Uh, all one word, no space. Um, you can also find my YouTube channel, which is probably going to be, I don't know, it might be fairly dead, uh, because I'm, I kind of want to know life Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. <laughs> um... But uh, me and Mel are finding time to uh, stream Tales of the Abyss, which uh, continues to be a fun time, except when sometimes you get a weird factory slash sewer puzzle yeah. involving light sources and switches. Yeah, last um, last night was not the best exploration-wise. Uh, but it w- Combat's opening up, though. We had, yeah. we had a fun... I gave Mel a time limit for how long I could stream, and then I forced myself to stay 30 minutes after yeah. because i wanted to talk about the combat system which was actually pretty yeah, we, fun we soft but, uh we soft like unintentionally got it waiting within the time limit and then just had a half hour discussion with the game paused in the save screen as like some people yes some, some of my mutuals <laughs> in the chat are just people who like know the game systems or like had a conversation with about like where we're feeling about the combat system or different perspectives on it and it was fun yes yeah. it was good yeah it was good it was nice cool. it, talking about games with your friends is fun yeah so you can go check that out on I have a playlist of our entire session, but yeah. Um, yeah, it was just, you know, fun talking about... Uh, it was nice to have a gameplay session after the preview session was all plot, but, you know. Mm-hmm. RPGs. Yeah, RPGs. It's, good, it's good. Speaking of talking about games with your friends, uh, just pulled up the, the grand finale of the, uh, the grand final of the Hidden Cup. Vasco da Gama. Is three nil up over Alexios Komnenos, so uh, it's uh, looking. So which one is uh, Viper? I don't fucking know. Probably the one that's it's winning. It's so weird to me <laughs> that Age of Empires two is still getting DLC. Yeah, yeah. It's like it, it's such a bizarre series. Like they made the HD version and then they made a definitive version, and then they also made the definitive version of one, and then they just made a DLC of two that was in the that was one. Yes. What a! Uh, they they basically they basically just oh did they, they basically just did they do the thing they basically just tried to make uh the definitive edition of Age of Empires two 
the one game you need to buy. A rip, okay. race, rip to AOE four. I don't know how that game did, but so so like, did they do the like Left 4 Dead thing where it's like, oh, you know, all the shit from the first game. What if we just put it into the the, the second one game? of the pro- one <laughs> of the, pro- the what they problem did? with Age of Empires four is it's Age of Empires two again because Age of Empires two is the popular one. But also, Age of Empires 2 is active, so why fucking bother? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and the other problem is, it's a 3D game, um, and so there are certain things that you can't do. Also, it's developed by... So, it's developed by Relic, who are... They are... They, 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 they are historically make good uh, RTS games. Uh, they generally make 3D RTS games. But they haven't you know, Age of Empire. They're not. They're kind of newish to the Age of Empires style, um, and um, there's this weird issue where, like, let me pull up an image. Sorry to add this weird addendum at the end, but I have to rant about unit design in RTS games because um, I want you to look at this screenshot right here of Plus Age of Empires new, uh... 4 oh I see terrain now these units I would not describe as very recognizable um no all these units there is too much color on them there is too much of them that is dedicated to the player color um compared to the Age of Empires 2 units which are much more um like most of the design of the unit is going to making the unit itself recognizable as the unit and then the color is uh yeah yeah it's it's age of empires 2 pikeman if i pull up the pikeman from age of empires 2 uh we will see um yeah so these guys these guys right here this is a tiny little image but um that's one unit that's the pikeman uh, it is recognizable from any angle as the pikeman because it's the it's the only thing that it's yeah. the only thing that looks like that, and it's just got these little hints of purple to it that identify it as that's the purple uh, player's unit. Um, whereas Age of Empires nice. Four, just ocean of colors, stupid. Anyway, I need to actually play Age of Empires Four because I, it's on my list uh, for my uh, bingo list for this year. <laughs> Um, I need to get back to Mizerna Falls, speaking of. Yeah. Um, all right, that was a weird addendum to add on to the end of this. Uh, but there we go. Yeah, it was fun, uh, though. Yeah. Bye-bye. See you next week. <laughs> See you next week for... Goodbye. Uh, whatever the fuck's on the other end of that batch of episodes. Yeah, yeah. we'll see. We'll see. See ya. Later. Oh